Hello, and welcome to Kazigram Dialogue, a podcast dedicated to having honest conversations on the issues most important to life and to our culture. You can find us online at kazingram.com. That's K A Z I N G R A M.com. We hope you enjoy this episode. Be sure to like and subscribe. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Amos Dober with the introduction. My guest today is Shan Go, Shan, or otherwise known as Jeff. He's a good friend of mine. He's an engineer, a martial artist, singer, and also an artist. In this episode, we discuss the afterlife, spirituality, traditional medicine, the sex industry, intimacy, cancel culture, guns, and police brutality. It's it's a long it's a longer episode, but I hope you enjoy it. Please welcome Shan to the Kazingham Dialogue. Jeff, good to see you again, man. Good to see you too, man. How are you? I'm doing good. Let me just open my beer. Go for it. Okay, so it's been six months yeah. since we last talked was on it? the podcast. Was it, uh, I think it was 2019, the last time we talked. Man, 2019. The podcast. 2008, 2020 is almost over. It's a, it's a different world. It's halfway <laughs> over. What do you think? What do you think about this whole situation with with people being indoors for now, almost four months? I think everyone's been weighing in on it. Um, for me, it's been like a very almost spiritual experience. Um, just having everything slowed down and a lot of self reflection, and uh, you know, I see it as an opportunity to work on yourself and to grow. Um, I'm also very grateful because I still have my job working from home and uh, super, super grateful for that. Cause I see a lot of people around me who are struggling, right? Especially if they own businesses and stuff. It's just been a crazy roller coaster of a year so far. Um, and it's just like, you know, if when, I ha- when, when I'm having a hard time, uh, I do try to stay grounded and mm-hmm. I try to look at the situation like, you know, I have it pretty good and to appreciate what it is I have and that we're kind of like all going through this together in a Mm. way, right? One of your biggest life philosophies, if I'm not mistaken, is to be grateful for every opportunity and to be thankful for what you have. Definitely. I think think it's like that's what keeps you grounded and also keeps you... um, It's like you want to work towards your goals and stuff. You still want to have... Uh, a sense of drive to want to move forward but you also need to appreciate uh where it is that you are in the current moment how do you balance that though you know because there's i think is there's, there's in one sense where you obviously want to be thankful for where you are and what you have but there's another sense where you don't want to stagnate you want to improve you want to get better you want to you know achieve more than what you currently have is there a sense where in you can balance that well enough. I think, I think it's, um, yeah, it's like you said, it's, it's balance, right? Um, one of the teachings of Buddhism mm. is about, you know, essentially what it is, is it's appreciation. Uh, but I think like I, my, my family's Buddhist. I just want to put that out there, but me myself, I'm not, uh, extremely religious, but I do read some of the teachings. So if I'm misquoting anything, I apologize. <laughs> But um, there's not really anything about sort of um, it, it's like it's like the opposite of drive, right? You almost want to like get rid of your wants because mm-hmm. that's what makes you unhappy. To me, that's that's something that doesn't uh, I, I don't necessarily identify with. I think like, again, what's important is that balance. So for me, I try to appreciate where I am, but I also try to look forward, um, and I try to kind of think about you know, like my life can still get better Mm. than what it is right now. Um, Yeah. Like you said, that it it is a hard balance, right? Because if you, if you're just completely happy where you are, then you don't grow, you stay stagnant. But also if you're constantly just looking at the next thing, you're also just, you're not happy. You're you're never going to be happy. Mm. Excuse me. We just ate dinner. So we just just had a big meal. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah, you know, I I think it's I think it's something it's one of those things where 
um, during this time, something that I've been reflecting on is I've been reading more Chinese philosophy. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you can, it's somewhere there. It's on the top left. There's uh, Confucius, uh, the Analect. The Analect. And <clears throat> it's kind of fascinating reading it because I, prior to 2020, or I suppose late 2019, I'd actually never read Chinese philosophy. I had only read like... Um, introductions to Chinese philosophy, never really read the sources. Okay. And something that I found profound is that, especially with Confucius, in that book, it's just like, you know, it's his sayings, I should say, yeah, it's his sayings that his students put together and then like, it's all numbered like one, two, three, four. It's very, very short paragraphs. But some of the things he says in there, it would take a lifetime to figure out, but it's just, it's just in this book. Yeah. Right? And, and so something that I had been thinking about is, man, and on on the on the one hand, I'm very happy that I found it, but on the other hand, I feel like, why didn't I why didn't I find this book way earlier? You know, maybe I could I could have, you know, done something or realized something much much more profound earlier on. Is there something specific in that book that really sticks out to you that, that speaks to you? Yeah, there's. There's a quote that I know it's it's very, 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 very often quoted by people. It's like all over Instagram. But in the, in it, he has a very, um, he says, and I'm paraphrasing. He says, um, a man has two lives. The second one begins when he realizes he only has one life. Oh, okay. Interesting. And like, you know, I read that and I thought, man, this is, this is, so true on you know it's, it's so true you i think we we live our life like we're never gonna die yeah i think i think it's almost like a, a way for us to keep saying right to like there's this uh it's like we're denying that we're not actually eternal you know what i'm saying mm. like it, it, because the thought of not being eternal is scary at least like uh, at least in this world right yeah, it's terrifying yeah I mean, just the thought of, just the, just the, just the thought that you will get to a point where you eventually die, and mm-hmm. maybe only a handful of people will remember you. Yeah. Maybe in three generations, maybe nobody will remember you. Who knows? It's, it's kind of terrifying. You're like, okay, well, what should I do? Is there something that I should be doing? Should I be like Elon Musk trying to get to Mars? <laughs> or try to build a neural link. Have Have you ever seen Coco? Is that a movie? It's a movie, yeah. No. Okay, so it's this movie. Um, I believe it's a me- Mexican culture. I don't want to misquote that, and someone calls me racist. <laughs> but it's uh, it, it's the whole premise of sort of the afterlife in this movie. Okay. Is that when you die, you go into the afterlife. And in the afterlife, you only remain in the afterlife so long as people remember you in the real world. So the whole Ooh. premise of the movie okay. is about all these generations and how this family honors um, their entire lineage all the way up to their you know great, 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 great grandparents or whatever. Um, and the importance of that is because uh, on the day of, I forgot what it's called in Spanish, but it's like Day of the oh, Dead. The day or of the Dead? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, the spirits can actually come into the real world Mm -hmm. and visit their family so long as they are remembered in the real world. Okay. So there's this one scene in the movie where there's uh, this person who passed away and he's in the afterlife. And uh, it's been many generations since since, um, he was alive. So he gets to this point where he this he it's called like I forgot what it's called. I think it's like the final death or something like that where he dis- he completely disappears because people forgot him because people forgot him yeah which is kind of like it, the whole movie is very sad but it's also very uplifting mm. but if you think about it that's like that's kind of dark right because it's going to get to a point where because because the, the underlying message there is that even the the afterlife is not eternal mm. right mm. so like that's something i don't know that movie always stuck with me it's supposed to, it's a kid's movie but it's very, it's very, like, it's very dark and, you know. What do you think? Because historically, we don't, you know, the, 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 the people we remember are the ones that tend to do something extravagant or something unique. So mm-hmm. I'm, I, I'm, I'm thinking specifically 
like all these philosophers that we remember and there are okay. lots of other philosophers during their time you know like during you know Descartes time there are lots of other philosophers but you know there's only a, a, other, a bunch of handful that we remember but everyone else we tell like nah you know they're not that important yeah and here we I think we often think that we're special you know like oh I'm the special one you know there's something unique in me but I mean mathematically you're probably not the special one no which is kind of it's a terrifying thought you're like man yeah. who's going to remember me besides my friends my family if i die well i think with technology it, that becomes very interesting mm. right because everybody sort of has this platform now where they can voice their opinion um oh, we're having a lot of that yeah a lot of COVID. that yeah <laughs> so the funny thing is people people talk about like Oh man, like nowadays there's so many dumb people out there. I was like, no, there's not that many more dumb people out there. It's just these people have a platform now. <laughs> like they can just, anyone can just throw their yeah. opinion out there. So that's one thing. Having this, you know, electronic, essentially database of ev everything you've said online, like your social media footprint. Um, but the other thing is uh, all this anti aging stuff hmm. that we're seeing. Uh, and if you talk to some people, they truly believe that we're going to be the generation that is going to be eternal. Like, like live forever. Live forever, yeah. Mm. The, the only way you die is some sort of unnatural causes. But um, if they can, you know, reverse the aging effect yeah. on your body, then you're theoretically, unless you have some sort of accident, you're eternal. To me, that's pretty scary, too. To live eternal in this body i think so yeah why um i think it's almost comforting to know that i'm gonna go someday mm. you know what i mean like it's it's like this um there's not this pressure to um like because in buddhism w one of the things is breaking the cycle of reincarnation right because buddhists believe in reincarnation and when you become enlightened you kind of you you reach nirvana mm -hmm. and you're no longer going to be um, in the cycle of reincarnation. So you're not going to be reset every time you die. Um, I don't know if I believe in that, but when people tell me about that kind of stuff, I always think to myself, like, not this lifetime, man. <laughs> not not this one. I'm just trying to chill. Are you, are you hoping that it won't happen this lifetime or do you think that it won't happen this lifetime? Um, it's like, I okay, say if it was true. I'm not saying it is true, yeah. but say if it was true, uh, I don't really want to put the work in for it because mm. it's very, okay. It's because it's, it, it encompasses more than just being a good person. If okay. it just meant being a good person, then I'm a hundred percent down for that. But this idea of letting go of, um, sort of your wants and just living this life of almost like this hermit life kind of thing. Like if you, if you think about like the monks, yeah, yeah the Buddhist yeah. monks, they pray all day. Um, they really find no joy, uh, at least the way that we do. And um, yeah, I don't know if I'm ready for that kind of commitment. Mm. I do like the idea of like the, the, the way of life and the teachings of Buddhism, but yeah, I don't know if I'm ready to, it's a, it's a very hard commitment. Yeah. Com compared to some other religions, you know what I mean. Like, I mean, it, it seems tough if 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 the way to, re like, if, if if the way to full nirvana is to live the monk life. Yeah, you know, not. I don't think many people can do that. I it, it, I think they've kind of restructured restructured a bit okay. to make it more viable for more people to want to follow. Hmm. So so like, it's just like uh, you know you have your monks who are super dedicated, and they live in the temples. But then you also have like followers and stuff. I'm not sure exactly what every single temple teaches. Yeah. But the temple that my mother goes to, they do talk about that. You don't have to live that sort of secluded lifestyle okay. to reach nirvana. Hmm. Um, but yeah, my, my original point being, it's like that idea of being just like, this is life and we're just going to be eternal hmm. forever and ever in this uh, plane of existence that's a little scary to me well, okay so say hypothetically okay hypothetically say we say we're able to reverse aging okay okay 
and we've we've got to a point so you're 50 so we're both 50 50 plus and technology is re- uh, caught up to the to the point where they figured out, oh yeah you know if you you know if you use crispr we have like crispr 10.0 and you know they're changing all sorts of things they say and now the cost for reversing aging is like extremely affordable even okay. like your low lower middle class people can you know can can reverse their aging and there's a salesman that came to your door and said hey mr mr shan you know this is the new product would you like it and you know they, they tell you the cost and it, let's say it costs as much as a secondhand car okay and there's enough clinical testing yeah there's enough clinical tax testing okay and if you do it you age let's say you can you can age up to 20 years below so you can go down to 30 yeah and you can stay there for like 100 200 years this is obviously this is hypothetical hypothetical but would you do it i think i'd be stupid not to do it right really yeah well well it's like a lot okay one of the big things right now is uh trt right yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah see lots of older men are taking trt now i have mixed feelings about it because i, I do believe even Does it, is there any negative are there negative effects to it? well you're 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 injecting external hormones into your body right even at the supervision of a doctor uh, but i think trt you know the, the clinical research that has gone into it it is relatively safe um does it make your ball shrink probably i don't know like i'm not a doctor right but it's like if you think about it your 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 balls are supposed to produce testosterone so yeah. but then again like at that age you're Maybe. probably not producing that much testosterone anyways right. so i don't think it, it it's really just bringing you back up to the level you were at when you were a young man. Okay. But I, I kind of have mixed feelings about it because I, I, I just don't know. I, I don't like the idea of external hormones, but that's just me. Mm. But if it's like this anti-aging thing that could do it, you know, no side effects, it's clinically, like that's basically the perfect TRT, right? Um, so if you're asking me, oh, are you, do you want to be athletic again? Do you want to, you know, do you want to um, essentially, you know, it's because it, it's like, it's not just being athletic. It's like once you hit 50, it, the next couple of decades, like everything's starting to shut down, right? It's not just, you know, your athleticism. It's literally your 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 way of life, um, your quality of life. So I think I would take it, but it's the idea of like living forever that I don't know if I want to do. Do you know what I'm saying? Okay, so you would take it if you know your life was extended by a hundred years. But if you were, if it, if they said, yeah, Mister Chen. Uh, we don't really know how long people live. Okay. See, the, it, it, like would it just, could be unending. I mean, I'm sure. I'm sure there's a way to reverse that. Listen, this is kind of dark, but <laughs> if you're just you're really not having it, like you live a hundred years, like, oh, I shouldn't have taken that. But you could always just jump off a building. Yeah, I, that's true. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's yeah. not. But it like, but what if like you don't take it? You're like, oh man, the the idea of eternity scares me, and you don't take it, right? And then like 30 years go by and you're like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> this sucks. <laughs> you take it when you're 80 and you're you like, know? 60? Dang it, I couldn't yeah. be 30 if I take it yeah, when I was exactly. 50. I feel like if, if I was completely sure that it was, uh, you know, it was clinically tested and it was safe, uh, I was 100% sure, I think I would take it. And mm-hmm. then I, it would, if anything, it would, it would uh, give me sort of like a buffering time to think about my decision. Would you take it? Man, that's that's tough. Would I take it? I, you know, something that you previously said is this life. Part of what makes this life enjoyable is, in one sense, the fact that you're getting older and you're gonna die. Yeah. And so you want to do things. You want to do. Th- you want to live courageously. That's the best word I can think of. You want to live like. Um, you in one sense you want to live like a in the best sense of the word like a hero for your own story Mm -hmm. you know you want to get to the end say okay you know ij talking to myself i've lived well and i'm happy to die right now and that's part of what makes living life now enjoyable in one because you're like okay i'm in the process of trying to achieve something but (laughs) but then if you were to live you know if i were if someone's like hey yo bro you can go live for 200 more years. I, I don't know if that would be, perhaps I would be like, yeah, that's kind of exciting, 200 more years. But at the same time, I wonder if it would take away that drive. Yeah, 
you become stagnant. You become stagnant. You're like, I could do this. Like, I yeah. don't have to be friends with Jeff right now. You know, maybe like 50 years <laughs> maybe from now. 50 years. If I took the pill as well, I'd have yeah. to take the pill as well. Because if I didn't take it, you just, oh shit, he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, God, oh, crap, I should have been his friend. <laughs> no, um, it, it is true. What, what do you think about the... Um, have you ever thought about the afterlife? Uh, I think about it all the time, man. What do you think about it? Um, I'm agnostic, so... Uh, I'm, I'm still for me it's like what kind of agnostic are we talking mm. about like are, we, are you agnostic like I go to church what uh, I, I didn't know that no, I, sorry I meant to say I go to church sometimes okay. like if people are like hey Jeff you want to come to church I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, man, okay. I come to church um, I've I've gone to I've, I've never gone to a mosque but I've been to a few like Muslim religious events yeah uh, I go to the Buddhist temple all the time but for me, like uh, spirituality and all that stuff is a very personal experience. Mm. Um, so I read a lot about this kind of stuff. And I am 26 this year. And I don't think I've uh, really made up my mind about what I believe the afterlife to be. But I do believe that there is something. Does that make sense? Yeah. So do you think, why is it that you think that there's something as opposed to this life being it and just, that's it? That's it. Nothing. I think I think if you look at um, just the universe, like not even just, a, you don't have to go that broad, but just our environment, um, there's just a lot of things that work so perfectly and in unison mm. that I like to believe that there's a bigger meaning to it, mm. right? Like it, it kind of goes back to like, you know, existentialism, right? It's like the the idea of like why are we here, and mm -hmm. it's like and, and and if you're sentient, you know even at a very basic level you'll question that. Mm -hmm. um, so like, I, probably not earthworms though. <laughs> I'm sure. I mean, <laughs> are they really sentient? Uh, I, I would say they, I mean they 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 fear birds. Okay. You know, they fear dying, so they'll come up when their houses are flooded and when there's a rain it'll come up but, but is that maybe that i feel like that's just like instincts like that's true that's, that's true that's so what would you say when you say sentient are you referring more so to like you know like uh are we talking about like a human being who has like who's mentally uh, uh handicapped or yeah that's a sentient about, being though? yeah, yeah I, mean, I mean but i mean like when you say basic sentient uh, are we talking like apes i would put i don't know i would even I might even put chimps in there, man. Yeah, you think They're, chips? You think chips are like, damn, bro. Like, why am I eating this fermented berry? <laughs> I feel like they're getting there. You think so? Well, the, if you look at animals, right? Like animals all have, excuse me, animals all have like their own personalities. Yeah, that's. And uh, there's like a lot of, you know, variety even amongst. I would say mostly mammals. Hmm. Um. But I think in terms of like questioning your your like your reason for existing, mm -hmm. I think obviously, at least in the context of our planet, um, humans. It seems very human centric. Yes, yes. Yeah. That's. I, I just think everyone else, everyone else, every <laughs> other species, is trying really hard to survive. You know, they're out there hustling, <laughs> so they don't got time to be like, yo, you know, yeah. are we? Uh, was was what is life? Yeah, yeah. It's not like the lions, like, oh, damn man, should I eat that deer, yeah. bro? Why is that? You you have to have a pretty good life to be able to do that. It is true. You know what I mean? You 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 have to have like a lot of time on your hands. A lot, a lot, a lot of time. And I think, you know, if we go back a few hundred years, you know, it's it's only the aristocrats who could think about these things because everyone else was out in the field working. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, we we're like our generation. We're living in like. We're living better than kings in one sense of oh, of all. hundred percent. The only thing that we don't have is power and influence. That's yeah. That's I mean, but now with social media, you have these, you know, in one sense, nobodies who've become like influencers with millions of followers and. Yeah, well, I I think it still I don't takes. Know if that's power. I I think it's um. Well, are you talking about people who are like? They have, they're famous on social media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stand they're famous on social media. They have influence over like people. Yeah. People do it. You know, if I, if you're an in, in, Instagram, <laughs> like an Instagram, in, in, like an influencer on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, if you're an Insta, yeah. I was gonna say an Instagram model, which is. Oh, I wish. 
<laughs> if you were one and you, you're like yo uh pay guys i'm using um i i was gonna say fair and lovely fair and lovely is just it's is this indian brand okay that basically lines their skin and okay. it's been like all over the news because now they're changing it but if you were okay. let's say before this happened they're like yeah hey bro hey guys i use fair and lovely to lighten okay. my skin blah 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 people go sure. against every fiber of my being yeah, I know. <laughs> but but i don't know man if they're paying me like millions i'd be like oh man but i mean you know people would be people would follow you and in that sense you know they they have power too they have power but i think um that's kind of been around since the beginning of time um, where you have one person who's just kind of very charismatic. There's something about them that um, the rest of us look at and deem leadership quality. So that's me. That, that that's been there since the beginning of like humankind, right? So it's like one person rises up mm. in in uh, you know a hunter gatherer kind of setting and becomes like, a chief. Yeah, yeah, and and it's just like uh, you know I you know I know what it is that we're supposed to do and they say it in a super charismatic way yeah. and everyone's like whoa this guy knows <laughs> you know and it's kind of like that social media has just made it more accessible and on on a on a larger scale yeah so these people who do have influence i mean not everybody right some people let's be real there's some dumb people out there who have <laughs> way too much influence on social media um but for the most part there's some there's some quality about that person that draws people to them right and then in a way um it's just that same sort of tribal setting hmm. on a larger scale hmm. for the modern era, hmm. right? Because not everybody can do that. Yeah, you're finding your own tribe. Yeah, even people who are, and there's like a lot of luck to it too, right? Even people who are, I think, very charismatic or have uh, very good leadership qualities, maybe it'll make them successful in their workplace, but it doesn't mean like people are going to listen to them on, on social media That's or like... True they'll be able to start a popular YouTube channel or something yeah. like that. It, it, there's like a certain degree of luck involved in it. Mm. So do you think, do you, do you, so with this whole thing, are we progressing towards a more decentralized world or are we reversing? I mean, I shouldn't even say reversing because we're living in a very centralized mm. sort of power uh, government. Do you think we're going towards a decentralized where everyone has their own tribe and then you know they haven't uh, that's i mean even then that's not really decentralized i should i'm not sure about that because i think um because of how much we're able to communicate through technology it's brought a lot of people closer together and i think for the most part um people are more unified than they've ever been hmm. but the problem is it's also allowed people who you know historically probably wouldn't have never come into contact with each other to have you know, super polar opposite opinions and there's like sort of this clash of ideology. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure about that. Um, I do think technology is bringing everyone closer together and it and, and it's creating this, um, like this online platform where people can share ideas and like, it, it's crazy just in the last, you know, 15 years, right? It's like, you can really learn a lot of things online. Everything you can pretty much to yeah, some I, degree. I, yeah, I would say everything. You, you have people learning carpentry mm -hmm. through youtube and then they they i was i'm just thinking of this one particular dude and now he just makes all these like super cool i don't know what they're called carpentry carpentry <laughs> things carpentry <laughs> things and he just sells them but he's like in the one in the interview he was like yeah i just learned it on youtube he's like what you learned this on youtube yeah i it's just yeah so there's that there's that side to it um and i also that's why i actually think like I said before, like people think people are getting dumber. People aren't getting dumber. It's just the dumb people have a platform to say stupid mm. shit now. Mm. But I, I think people are actually becoming more intelligent because it's, it's so easy to share information. And if you have um, the drive and the willpower, you can learn a lot of things just through online. Like you don't, you just, you really just need an internet connection, mm. which of course there's like a, there's like a, you know, that, that that could be a barrier for some yeah. people but for the most part it's like it's not as much of you know you don't you don't need to pay super high tuition to learn a lot of things i think e-learning is really the future mm -hmm. right but the flip side to that is that it's also you know loss of accountability mm -hmm. because all these discussions are taking you know they're taking place online so people can say some of the most horrendous shit you ever heard in your life and then 
they don't have to be accountable. Right. And it used to be better with Facebook because, you know, it's your profile attached to it. It's your picture. Um, and there's ties to your real life versus, you know, YouTube or like a Reddit forum or something like that. But nowadays people make fake Facebook accounts just to troll people. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's really sad. Like if that's what you do in your spare time, mm -hmm. but it, it, yeah. So it's like that lack of accountability to me, um, is very jarring. Mm. And I think that's almost, that's like counterproductive to us, um, coming closer together as, yeah. you know, a as species, like a, I guess yeah, as a society, because we have on our phones, which is, what well, I don't know how much that like eight inches. Mm -hmm. eight by four inches you have like you have the world's library at your fingertips yeah. which nobody in human history has had yep you know the the famous i think it's called the uh library of alexandria that got burnt down yep yep you know those were like only the the best of the best of the scholars were there yeah and even then you got to like go through the the shelves and you know what is this in alphabetical order <laughs> what page is it yeah you open that shit up and it's then like, like just go through it and, oh yeah it's yeah. true now you can just like google something you're like oh i don't know how yeah. to you know do x yeah. and like, you don't even have to type it in anymore you can just talk to your phone and your yeah. phone will pull that up for you right so, so like there is this really great resource that's really available to the vast majority of the world not everybody mm -hmm. but the vast majority of at least the first world and um, it's really allowing a lot of really cool things to take place within our society, right? And I think with every generation, it's like, you know, like kind of from our generation down, everyone's technologically literate. Mm. Mm. It's not a lot of people who can't use a computer anymore. Um, well, you know, older people, but just like, mean, our, like people below our generation everyone can use a computer yeah almost everyone I should our, say. our parents generation it was uh it was considered a you know like almost a rare skill to be able to type fast do you did you ever take the uh, computer classes in high school or like not even in high school middle in school elementary i think yeah yeah there was like uh I, I forget what the classes were called but they would show us i remember this was back in india <laughs> yeah, okay and like there's like one computer for the whole school in every class, like like standard one, standard twos, everyone would have a cl a session uh, once a week, I believe. And I still remember because basically, <clears throat> they were, they were the, you know, the old school, like big ass computer screens yeah. and then the big ass towers. So the whole, like the, I remember the, cl the class would be, they'd be like, what is this called? And we'd have to, mem we'd draw it out. <laughs> <laughs> this is like tower. And then we'd do monitor and then put keyboard mouse and we tried to remember all these things right because it was so new but now i could just whip out this laptop and most likely you know our friends they have a two-year-old yeah you know she has an ipad like she knows how to use that thing yeah, it's almost weird because no one's teaching them yeah it's almost like they intuitively know and uh i'm sorry i really have to use the bathroom <laughs> use the bathroom do it do it <laughs> uh. Jeff is gone using the bathroom, so. Yeah, I, I, I didn't drink my beer because uh, I've been holding it for a while. <laughs> I, I actually went right this before. Way, this way, put the mic. Okay. Like yeah, this? yeah, that way, that way. Is that good? Okay. Um, you had to pee for a while? Yeah, I had to pee for a while. I was <laughs> trying to hold it. I'm like, there's no way. Uh, I drink a lot of water throughout the day. I try yeah. to stay hydrated, Yeah. which is a good thing, except when you need to sit down for long periods of time and have discussions about technology and the afterlife <laughs> the, I was I, um, I'm reading this book by uh, crap I think it's called Own Your Day by Marcus Mark Aubrey Marcus or something I forget what his name is he's like the owner of On It okay and in the book he was just talking about how he starts his day and he starts his day by drinking um, water with sea salt and lime oh yeah I've heard that yeah yeah that's cool it's, I, I, I never heard it anyways but he's talking about it and he's like yeah throughout the day I drink water like this so today I was like all right, let me try this. So I put it, and I just like, I, I think I drank the water because it tasted so yummy. Okay. With the salt. Okay. And so I just kind of been drinking, and that's why you know earlier I was like, "Yo, have you peed?" Because I was like, I had to pee. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I did pee. I, I went right before the. <laughs> My grandma used to do that. She used to make us um, drink uh, honey with salt and, and warm water in the morning. 
Really? Yeah. And Did she's she like, say why? She's like, oh, it's good for your digestion, and it, 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 it it's like it's good in the morning. Like it. Excuse me. Flushes. Flushes you out. So my grandma, my grandma's really into health. See, I wonder if what your grandma said is is true, because there are a lot of these a, a, ancient is not the right word traditional perspective on medicine that when when it was brought over to the west or when the west was introduced i shouldn't even say the west like very specifically certain doctors they're like yeah this doesn't this it's not scientifically proven so it's wrong so for example the most recent one being um they found that there's a connection between your gut and your brain yeah for sure and chinese medicine and even indian medicine uh ancient uh, traditional medicines have said that there is a connection between your brain and your gut and mm-hmm. it's it's been passed on but for years there's no this is this is all bull crap and now all of a sudden they're like oh actually yeah it's true and you know that's not to that's not to trash science mm-hmm. as, as, a, as a field but what i'm just wondering is you know something like what your grandma taught you guys to do you know i'm sure your grandma was taught this let's just say by her mom and then to her by her mom and so there is a sense of, it's in one sense you could even call it science because they're doing it through observation. Yeah. They're saying, "Oh, we've been doing this. It seemed to help. Let's continue this because it seems to have helped." And people who haven't done this have had uh, problems. Yeah. So China kind of has a weird, like China's kind of unique in this way, because there's a huge cultural shift in the 20th century, and that of course is. Um, right at the beginning of the 20th century that was uh the end of our emperor like we no longer had a a monarchy system then the nationalists took power for a little bit this is a huge like segue (laughs) talking about like but um but then the the communists took power um sort of you know about halfway through uh the 20th century so there's like this rejection of a lot of the things that um, a lot of knowledge accumulated sort of th- through different generations of China. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of the attitudes that I was getting when I was living in China in the 90s was that a lot of the stuff, they call it um, mi xin, which directly translated, it means blind belief. Okay. Um, it could be a lot of things. They, they can refer to religion like this, but also uh, a lot of stuff like you know, maybe ancient Chinese medicine and stuff like that. Um, That's what they call blind belief. Yeah. Like it's, it's this idea that you're blindly believing yeah, yeah. something. Um, in English, we might call it faith, but or blind faith, more blind accurate. faith. Yeah. That's more accurate. Um, so a lot of the stuff she actually picked up from reading books and ironically, a lot of it was traditional Chinese. You know what I mean? Because my, my grandma, like, I don't think she really thinks about this, but, um, it's almost like a paradox in a weird way because she's very, because she lived through that period of time where, um, you know, the Japanese were coming in and mm. all these horrendous things were taking place in China, like war crimes and whatnot. Yeah. And then also uh, a lot of the tyranny of the nationalists who demanded a lot of um, like taxes from in the forms of for, like, no, no joke in the form of rice. Like that's how you paid them in wow. bags of rice so they can feed their troops. Uh, so it's like, she's very devoted to communism because she mm. feels like, like they got them out. Yeah. Like the, it saved the lives of our people kind of thing. And then the communists reject a lot of this traditional belief, yeah. like, you know, ac- uh, no, not, not acupuncture. That's uh that's accepted in China. But yeah, it's like a lot of this, like, traditional medicine and stuff like um or blind belief like people don't necessarily uh accept that Mm -hmm. but then there's but then i don't know there are people like your grandma who yeah who let's say um appreciates the party but also appreciates what the party rejects yeah Yeah. but but then it's this weird it's it's weird like the party's not consistent right because during the cultural revolution there was this idea that we should throw away everything that's traditional, like part of our heritage yeah. so that we can modernize China. And, um, so, so then they rejected like all of these things that, you know, like 
uh, our, our, our temples were burned down, you know, like certain statues were mm-hmm. smashed um, and in this attempt to modernize China. Mm-hmm. But then they realized that, you know, this brings in a lot of tourists and we can make a lot of money off of this. So then they kind of like backtracked and they rebuilt a bunch of them. Yeah. I'll be honest with you, when I go to China and I walk through uh, palaces and temples, like historical sites and stuff, and I walk past um, a site that's burned down. It always says the French did it. The French did it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. it doesn't. Does it no, really? it does, it does, it does. And, and some of it is the French. But so even like, if the Chinese did it, it would say the French did it. That's just my suspicion. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, because the French, the, the French messed up a bunch yeah. of shit, you know? So, the French. I, I, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they're just like, whatever, we'll just, we'll just pin this on them too. I'm surprised they wouldn't say like, um, you know, the one of the, I think one of the most horrific things in human history, one of the most horrific, not is the uh, the rape of Nanking. Yeah, terrible. You know, you you read about what the Japanese did when they came in and you like there've been there've been times when I've been reading accounts of it and I think this has to be made up. Like the mm-hmm. they were so brutal. Like the Jap I don't know what's up with the Japanese. Like right now they're like one of the most mass uh, massive passive. They they're mm-hmm. so passive, you know the the Japanese men, not all Japanese men, but you know, there's a lot of like men in Japan marrying like anime characters and you know waifu. <laughs> yeah. I forget what the, all the terms are. That's like a weird subculture. Yeah, like a, but, but it's you know it's a thing, and there's also a sense of like I was reading somewhere that Japanese men. I forget what the uh, number is, but the majority of Japanese men are all single above yeah. the age of forty five or something. Yeah, and but you you read this account of modern Japan, and then you read of what the Japanese soldiers did. Yeah. in Nanking. Yeah. And they're they're just so drastically different. Well, there's a, there's kind of a reason for that, right? And a big part of it is that they lost the war. And to be um they're essentially demilitarized um by the victors of World War 2. Um a lot of American culture yeah. ended up going into Japan. Mm. And it's sort of like that's that whole sh- cultural shift. Mm. Especially because if you have a historical, you know, something as significant as World War II, um, it's almost like if you are on the wrong side of history, you almost want to reject that. A lot of stuff that happened in, uh, in Mandarin, we, we call it Nanjing, but... Um, that's how you say it. That's how you say it. Nanjing. Yeah, Nanjing is like the old way of pronouncing like it's um it's like the japanese what the japanese i think it's like the west the west West, like they had their own phonetic system for mandarin but um, we call it nanjing but the a lot of the atrocities that happened there um i was was reading some stuff on it and of course i can't speak as if it's fact but a lot of things that people attribute to that happening was that the japanese um, especially the military got a lot of their culture from samurai culture Mm. This idea of like dying a glorious death. Mm-hmm. Um, that whole situation is very nuanced. So the guy who was leading the troops, I forget his name. Yeah. But the guy who was leading the Japanese troops, he was actually uh, like a huge connoisseur, you might say, of Chinese culture. He loved China. He almost saw China as the big brother of Japan. Uh, okay. Um, because a lot of, Japanese culture can be traced back to um, ramen, the, for example. <laughs> yeah, like a lot of that stuff. Like even the 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 culture, the clothing, the weapons, yeah. like stuff like that. It can be traced back to maybe not specifically China, but like that that well that region. Like yeah. China is so big, yeah. you, you mm-hmm. it would have to f- flow over. Yeah, like that East Asian region. So he almost saw um, China as sort of the older brother of Japan, kind of mm-hmm. thing. And he and he and he loved Chinese culture. I think he, he well, he knew how to speak Mandarin. Um, he and he was really into calligraphy, Chinese calligraphy. He's really into art, the culture. Um, so when the war started happening, he saw his role as um, essentially correcting a, a family member. You know what I mean? Like China's oh, acting okay, up. Yeah. It's our job. Like you were spanking them. Or yeah, something. yeah, something like that. Like it, we're disciplining them okay. to make sh- to make sh- make them see the light. That's how he saw it. His troops didn't necessarily see it that way, and he wasn't actually 
from what I read, he wasn't actually a, a big part of a lot of those operations. So he was kind of making decisions at the top, but mm-hmm. a lot of these atrocities that were happening happened un- unbeknownst to him. Um, that and, seems surprising, though. I, I don't know. Like, history is weird yeah. that way, right? You just don't... Like, if you're leading the troops... Well, it's just like he would he would um, kind of come in for, you know, to, to, to essentially, like, you know, like, say if they took a city or something like that, he would come in for that. But he wouldn't be there like fighting with them kind of thing. Um, And that and that actually kind of led to a lot of the more messed up things that happened during that period of time, because I think uh, and I read this so long ago, so I'm not saying this is 100 percent fact, but I think it was something like they took the city and he was supposed to come in two days. So they had to clear out the city of any sort of, you know, anyone, any fighters who stayed behind and stuff like that. So. Uh, their way of doing that was to brutalize them. And a lot of it had to do with, again, that sort of, you know, that samurai culture kind of thing. Like no mercy. Sort yeah. Of. No mercy, um, death before surrender yeah. kind of thing. And so what it was, was because the Chinese and the Japanese were fighting in this area for so long and it was such a bitter fight, they didn't expect the Chinese troops to put up as much fight as they did. Hmm. So they ended up, so on the Japanese side, they ended up losing, um, a lot of their troops, right? They thought it was going to be easy and it wasn't. So there was a lot of hatred towards them. Like, it's kind of like you just hate them so much, right? They're causing you like pain and suffering, but it's at the end of the day, it's a war. Um, when the Chinese troops, when the Chinese troops lost, a lot of them retreated and apparently some of them um, essentially abandoned their posts. Like they abandoned their uniform and pretended to be civilians. So this, this kind of, because they lost, and this kind of opened up this idea that they're they're subhuman to a lot of these Japanese troops because to them it's like you never give up. You never give up. Yeah. So it's like okay, so now you're subhuman. So therefore, like whatever we do to you um, is justified because you're not a human yeah. being. That's interesting. And s- some of the most horrible things that ever happened throughout the entire war happened during yeah. that in it, that region during that period of time. If you haven't read about the, uh, that uh, Nankin or Nanjing, yeah. It, just read it up it's absolutely terrible i mean the japanese though even during the second war um i i i wish i could remember what the project was called but it was a project that they did to do um experiments on human and it was led by this japanese ma- major i forget what his name is too mm-hmm. and Chan, the stuff that they did in that experimental island is absolutely like out of this world so one of the things they did was they would capture Chinese mm-hmm. citizens. It didn't matter who, men, women, children, doesn't matter. They would capture them. And they would experiment on them. So they would, you know, they would give them, they would they would be experimenting on diseases and then they would inject the disease into these people. Uh, they would see how long it took, <clears throat> how long it took people to die of electric shock. They would see how long it took to for people to die of like um, a slow torture, like how long it took if you slowly chopped off people and some of the mo- one of, and this is obviously if if you are uncomfortable with this, you should stop listening to this. But one of the things they did that I just like it was so disturbing is they would inject pregnant women with um, I forget what the what what that virus was, but they would inject it, and then so sorry, so these women were pregnant because they were raped by the soldiers, mm-hmm. but then they would inject these women. And then when the baby was around like eight months, they would slash open the womb and then pull out the baby and to see if the baby was infected, you know, and then they would kill the baby. And then they would just do this over and over again. And one of the craziest thing, this is where it goes, it goes, they wrote medical papers that were submitted into, I forget what the journal was. And they, and they called these, these Chinese long tailed monkeys. So they said, we experimented on these long-tailed monkeys by doing X. And then everyone else reading it thought, oh, yeah, these are just monkeys, you know, whatever. But it turned out they were human. They were Chinese captured um, POWs, right? And so, yeah, like, Japanese culture, I mean, the Japanese nation right now, it just it seems so vastly different from what they were like before. Uh, that's why there's still a lot of tension between the Chinese and the Japanese, even to this day. A lot of it does have to do with the fact that Japan 
um, as a nation ha- re- refuses to apologize for that. Japan as a nation. They, yeah, they, mm. they kind of deny a lot of those things happen, <laughs> uh, which is kind of weird to me because there's documentation from their side yeah. about it. So I don't understand how you can deny that. Um, you think that your like, people in your grandmother's generation still have harbor definitely hard feelings towards definitely. Japanese. Um, I personally don't because um, I don't believe you should pay for the sins of your ancestors. Um, maybe that's a very Western way of thinking. It's sort of like, but whereas um, sort of the more Asian way of thinking is that everything is generational, right? Like you are an extension of your ancestors and your children are an extension of you. Right. Like so, if you get dishonored, mm-hmm. if I dishonor you, then my your kid could tr- take revenge on my kid or something. Uh, I don't know if it's to that degree, but it is. A, there's this more sense of like uh, family union kind of thing. Um, so yeah, they're definitely. You know, my grandmother. My grandmother uh, w- would lose her mind if I married a Japanese girl. She, <laughs> yeah, she would, man. Really? To this To this day, to this day, she would. Uh, she hates them, man. Like, she's such a sweet, loving person. Yeah. Until you talk about the Japanese. And she's like, no. Not the Japanese. So I don't even bring it up with her. Yeah. I have Japanese friends. If, you're, if any of you are listening to this, I love you. And uh, I don't have a problem with you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but uh, it's it's uh, it's just a different way of thinking, man. I mean, it, and on on the one hand, you know, if you've if you've if you lived something, if you lived through something like that, something that hor- horrific, and you know about it, and maybe you know people, and then you know the the nation that did it to you, it it I would think it would take some time to just be like, okay. I think if I lived through it, it'd be different. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of things, uh, if you are experience of experiencing it firsthand like for example uh, i don't believe in the death penalty mm. uh, because i don't believe that us as humans have uh essentially the wisdom to decide who lives and who dies mm. but if i had a child and someone killed my child mm. i feel like i'd want to kill them yeah you know what, what i mean what, if, if if you don't believe in the death penalty would you believe in a hundred year like a uh, hundred or like a life sentence that's pretty much the the, the death penalty unless you take the pill right <laughs> but even then you know it's like i'm thinking i'm thinking serial killers yeah rapists like hardcore mm-hmm. not hardcore serial i think they're called serial rapists as well right yeah you know the, I, the worst pedophiles yeah like yeah. those man i don't know if those i i feel like the death sentence if you take another human life mm-hmm. and if you take multiple human lives and you and you you know you're going around being a uh, you know uh, raping children women men okay. whatever I don't know about that but like but that's what a life sentence is for right cuz you're not killing them yeah but I don't know like see if if like it was one of my kids yeah I'd probably want to kill them yeah. I just I have to be honest with myself right but you know the principle of it i don't know if uh i think you know because we don't have the death penalty in canada no we have like a 25 year limit well a lot of people go to prison for life i don't know they only go up to it goes up to 25 i think is it is it 25 with a chance of parole or something like yeah, that 25 we have i don't know if i ever sent you this article okay but um I forget what it was. I think it's the National Post made mm-hmm. a list of pedophiles. Okay. Convicted. These are convicted pedophiles. Okay. Who were released early. And some of yeah. them were like, okay, the longest one I believe was 10 years. Okay. But they were pedophiles who were convicted. These are like, co- pro- like proven guilty. They're, it's not like, oh, we're not sure. We don't have enough evidence. Like there was one guy convicted three times. On, oh, sorry. Con- uh, convicted on three accounts. Okay. Uh, molesting and raping children under the age of 11 yeah. girls. Yeah. He was let out in, I think, seven years. S- seven years, Jeff. Yeah, that's messed up. But what if we chemically castrated them? <laughs> <laughs> that, I mean, that's... It's true. I mean... So they don't have the urge. Yeah. 
or yeah i mean is that any what if instead it was a life sentence in a concrete box that's pretty brutal that's i think that's worse than death you think so yeah because humans need to be socialized mm mm-hmm. But is, isn't that a strong enough punishment? Cause Life death, sentence in a concrete box? Yeah. That's pretty brutal, man. I think I'd rather die. Hmm. If that was me. Well, they probably kill themselves. Yeah, I'm sure that's they That's probably would. what happened. Um, actually, a friend of mine, she... Um, shout out to Hira, if you're listening to this. Yeah, shout out. Um, but she's um, she wrote a... I think she, I don't want to misquote her here. This is my biggest fear about coming on podcasts. Is this quoting? This is this is paraphrasing. This is a paraphrase. paraphrasing. But she did her. She did her. I want to say masters. I'm pretty sure masters. She went to Oxford. I'm pretty sure she went to Oxford. And I and and uh, the subject, well, the topic was uh, pedophilia. Hmm. And what she was telling me was, um, it's her theory. Might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure this is what it is. I just don't want to. I'm just covering my bases here, um, but. It's the idea that uh, pedophiles, they, they're they wired wrong mentally. Well, that's obvious. But the reason is because th- um, the part of your brain that thinks children are cute yeah. and the part of your brain that uh, finds find something yeah sexually arousing uh-huh. is messed up. Okay. So normal people look at a child and they're like, oh my God, the kid's so cute. Like, I just want to hug that child, right? But then pedophiles look at the children and their brain can't, distinguish between that and sexual attraction and that's why that's what causes them to do but it doesn't justify it it doesn't justify it but i'm saying you could say that about so many things though yeah you can you know you could be like man my brain's wired to think i'm married but my brain's wired to see every other woman as super attractive and i want to go and have sex with them so i think it's okay yeah but i think it's just like it, it's just the stakes are so much higher when you kill someone like sorry on with the death penalty you mean yeah well no i just mean like the stakes are so much higher like okay don't don't cheat on your spouse it's a terrible thing but the ramifications of that versus being caught for pedophilia yeah is it's just not the same so like the idea is it's like why did they do the things they do yeah is it because okay louis ck has a joke about this and it's terrible okay. but he was saying like well it must be really good to them. Yeah. Right. That it's worth it. Yeah. And it's, and it's this idea that like, should we be viewing them as sick people that need treatment? Well, I, I, I would think you would have to in one sense. Right. But it's also, I think there's a, uh, there's a very fa- uh, famous distinction within, um, Thomistic philosophy where they say, look, uh, evil is that which is a privation of something good. Mm-hmm. So, you know, say love, you know, um, eros love, you know, loving your spouse, loving someone in a very attractive manner. That is good, you know, because you want to find a partner, you want to have kids, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but something evil would be a, a, a deviation from that, okay. you know. So you would look at a child okay. and then you would be attracted to the child and you would think, oh, I, you know, I want to be with this child forever just like you would think of an adult person okay and so in it, obviously with the case of pedophilia it would be precisely this it would be a um misapprehending of what is actually good mm-hmm. so you're apprehending something evil and thinking oh this is good so i'm going to do it okay and so in that case even if we could explain the neurochemistry behind it you know it, like sometimes i think cuz you know there there are some cases that you read of I'm not a lawyer, but when you you know when the news uh, when the newspaper writes it up and they're like, yeah, this person was convicted, but then they were let off on parole or they got less sentence because the psychiatrist the psychologist came in and then said, you know, something's wrong with their brain and they did this, they they had no control over it, and I'm thinking, well, perhaps that's true to an extent, you know, perhaps, but ultimately, I think human beings have that capacity to be the deciding factor, unless you're drunk or you're completely incap- incapacitated somehow by some drugs. Mm-hmm. If you're perfectly fine, I would think you have that willpower to say, okay, I know 
this is wrong. Mm-hmm. I shouldn't do it. So I'm not going to do it. Even though there's everything in me is urging me to do it. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, I guess it's empathy, right? Like, are you able to, um, well, some people aren't able to feel empathy. Sociopaths. Right? Sociopaths. They can feel fake empathy. Yes. That's what it is, right? But, but it's like, that's, um, yeah, see, like, I guess you can, com- you, you can explain a lot of evil things people do just with neuroscience, right? Mm-hmm. You can explain almost everything people choose to do with neuroscience. You can explain a lot of things, right? yeah. Yeah. So I see what you're saying when it comes to like, just because you can explain it doesn't mean, well, nobody's saying it's okay, but some people are like, who's saying it's okay. Okay. I wish. Okay. So there's a, there's a professor. Okay. I'm just on my phone just cause I want to get this name correct. As a professor of hypersexuality. Okay. At the university of Toronto. Okay. Um, sexuality. And he is, uh, he is on this group. I forget what the group is called. Hypersexuality at the University of Toronto. He's part of this organization that's trying to normalize pedophilia. Okay. And I, I, I don't, it's, I can't remember what the name is called. Normalize like we should allow it. Yeah. That there's, there's, there, there's nothing wrong with them. There's definitely something wrong with that. Child can't consent. Well, I, I agree with you. Okay. But I mean, I I've heard the argument that we should allow um computer generated child pornography mm-hmm. to appease these people yeah. so that they don't try it in real life. Um I've heard that argument. Yeah. I've never heard that you should allow and I I I I disagree with even that, but I never heard the argument that uh, you should actually just straight up allow these relationships. Well, so it's part of this group. So I was reading. I so I, I was reading up on it. Uh, there was a news article on it, and there was. See, I, I can't remember what the thing, but okay. So I don't know if it's this guy particularly that I'm thinking about. But this guy's like a, he's a professor of University of Toronto. You can find it. Okay. This is all this is all very public, uh, but it's like James Cantor, and he has you know research into um, hebophilia. I don't know what that is. Homosexuality, hypersexuality, paraphilia, pedophilia, transsexuality, and in pedophilia, he's got a, you know a bunch of papers on it. But the organization that he was part of, or maybe he's not associated with it anymore. Um, I remember the website. It's black. Okay. Um, and it, it basically was just saying that the pedophilia is, you can explain it through the brain. Mm-hmm. Um, we shouldn't be, what's the word? We shouldn't be ostracizing them. Okay. Um, and their what they do, their feelings are perfectly normal. No, it's not. Well, if you, so I, I don't want, I, I obviously don't want to misrepresent their argument at all. Okay. But, it 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 went something along the lines of, um, you, the 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 feelings that they have towards kids is normal because it's happening to them. Okay, you know, and you can explain it through all the neurochemistry. So for us to say what they are feeling is wrong is um, ostracizing them and it's doing them more harm. So what's the alternative? What should we be doing? I don't know. Let them fuck kids. That's that's I, you. What? Okay. So so you were saying about the the um, the uh, AI generated. Child yeah. Pornography. So I've heard this argument that you should allow uh, computer generated child pornography to be a thing, so that it's like an outlet for these people. Yeah. Um, I think I personally think that's very dangerous mm. because because <sighs> it just normalizes. Then again, you can make the same argument about video games, right? Because there's so much violence in video games. Mm-hmm. So maybe I'm wrong about that. I don't know. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a, yeah. you know. What if, uh, what What about the, have you heard the other argument where they said, oh, we should make child dolls and then they could, they're like child sex dolls. I just feel like, I don't know, man. That's a slippery slope mm-hmm. because I, I just feel like you're, it's kind of like you're almost encouraging that kind of behavior. 
you're almost like, oh, well, you know, it's like, we're going to let you act it out. Yeah. But you can't have the real thing. Yeah. And I think after a while, these people are going to want the real thing. Yeah. Especially if you think about the fact that um, if my friend's, you know, theory is true. Yeah. I don't know if it's just specifically her theory, but if that theory is true, that uh, you're, you're sexually attracted to a child because you can't differentiate between thinking something is cute and you know sexual arousal yeah um uh, then you know a doll is not gonna cut it for you mm. you know what i mean like it's not like do you look at a fake thing and it's like oh that's cute yeah yeah, yeah. i see what you're saying um uh, but i don't know right like i'm not an expert in this but i just think that's a slippery slope and i also think it sends the wrong message because mm-hmm. you because now you have um you you have you have sex sex dolls that are ai uh that have, that have that have ai in them so they have uh, so i can't remember what the uh, i think it's called like i did for I, I did research on this for philosophy and i think it's called real i think it's like real sex dolls dot ai or okay. so, i don't know what something like that and what they do is they put these robots at the <laughs> jeff these sex dolls their their eye the whole face moves their That's mouth creepy. moves and because it's got some sort of ai algorithm in it the sex doll starts responding to in quotes the master okay, okay? so this is where, where things get super weird so you have a your, your phone is uh you download this app okay. the real sex doll app on your phone what you can do is you can choose personalities okay on your phone so there are like i think uh, like 20 uh, the last time i checked i think it's like 10, 10 or 20 uh, different personalities. So each interaction with this sex doll could be a different person in quotes. Okay. But the person, so say it was Sarah, right, that you were using. Apologies to anyone named yeah, Sarah. Yeah, sorry. Uh, say, say it was Sarah, and then tomorrow you wanted Tiffany or something. Sarah, the information that Sarah has on you, the master, is not passed to Tiffany. So when okay. Tiffany interacts the AI interacts with the you, the user, it's as if she's a new person. And so some of the philosophers, some of the, some philosophy people were like, well, this is why, like this, this actually perpetuates, um, what's the word they use? Perpetuates. Well, one, one of the terms they use was toxic ma- masculinity. Right? Okay. It, it makes people use, uh, this um like you associate women as sex objects just sex objects okay. that you just kind of keep switching between because obviously you're just on your phone going yeah. you know you're switching i mean i don't know how different it is but how different is that than porn yeah well but i mean the big difference is this is a sex object it's, it's like, like a, it's like a real thing i guess it's like a real thing you yeah. know like everything anatom- anatomically it's like very real to i don't know who it's based off okay. but it's very real um, and so some people were saying, look, some ethicists were saying, look, this is, this is terrible because now you're just teaching these men or women to see women because all these sex dolls, <laughs> the funny thing is all the sex dolls are all women. There's like no male sex dolls at this point. The AI generated male okay, sex dolls. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm, yeah. I'm saying there, there definitely no, is there male definitely sex dolls. But like AI generated sex mm-hmm. dolls. So these people, these ethicists are saying, look, you're, you're just perpetuating the idea that women are just sex objects. Yeah to be played with and, you know, do whatever with. And especially if, um, if these robots have sentience, that's scary. They can't consent because they can't move their arms. Yeah. The only thing that, you know, it's just their mind. I'm saying mind, but it's just their algorithm talking to you. Well, I mean, I don't think AI is at that level of, you know, complexity yet, but, uh, it's certainly weird, but I think there's much more stranger things out there. You know what I mean? One of the things I've always found pretty fucking funny <laughs> is, you know, those full body sex suits that people put on? No, I don't. Okay. So it's like this full body suit and it like, there's, it, it like heats up and then you put on these VR goggles and there's like this fleshlight that moves with the, the, so like you put on, yeah, yeah. I don't know if it's like a like a game or a video, but like the suit and like the flashlight move in unison. This is a real thing. This is a real thing. Yeah, yeah. 
So I thought this was fake. No, this is real. And one of the things that I thought was pretty fucking funny is if you're <laughs> if a guy's using that, like yeah. imagine the moment he comes, like that oh shit moment, like because he's got to put on this whole suit and like boot up this software and put on these goggles and it's like skin tight, and then you know he's like oh yeah, yeah he's so into it he's like oh this is great and then as soon as he comes he's got to be like what am I doing with my life like because <laughs> if you because like. I mean, okay, like if you if you sleep with a person that you probably shouldn't have slept with, yeah, there's like that sense of shame afterwards. You're like, oh, what am like I doing? Shame, shame and regret. It's like, like oh, what, right. what, what, what am I doing with my life? And but then you could just kind of like you clean up, you get up, and you with this suit, you gotta like take the whole thing off, and you gotta clean it, and it's like it's a long process. You know what I mean? So it's just like that whole <laughs> that entire like 15 minutes of like oh, you're like watching the flashlight in the sink, like. Oh. What am I doing with my life? <laughs> man, I, I I honestly can't believe this is a real thing. It's a real thing, man. You, you know, like, there's a saying, I don't know the exact saying, but it was something along the lines of uh, whenever there's innovative technology, the first people, the first thing people will do is try to figure out if they can have sex with it. <laughs> it's true, man. Like, look, look at, like, soon as people, as soon as people invented cameras, probably someone was like, Coming to film some people fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> definitely that's true i mean uh who was i there was a, there was some like a famous uh business guy who was saying if you want to know which industry is always on the edge of technology he was saying the industry that's always like always on the cutting edge always trying to make the most of whatever software technologies out there is always he was just saying it's always the porn industry because mm. they know they can make so much money because you know, obviously the porn industry is um, grabbing the attention of people. Yeah. So they always want the best. They always want the best technology, all the best techno- uh, software. But going back to the to the to pedophilia. So the reason I brought up the AI is obviously I I think I know what you would say, but if the AI if the the you know this sex doll this child sex was doll, a child yeah that's really messed up man. I don't even like the whole idea of, um, listen, man, I, I try not to pass judgment on other people, especially if they're not hurting anyone, but I just don't think it's healthy to be like, we were talking earlier, you were, you were talking earlier about in Japan, this culture of, um, marrying an inanimate object. Yeah. Well, some they're people call take, waifu, right? Yeah. But sometimes okay. it's an AI. Sometimes it's an AI. Yeah. 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 We yeah, had yeah. this conversation. Yes. Yes. So they'll have like, um, these, these uh, anime characters that are programmed into like this uh, it's like a pyramid that has you know holographic projections and then like your wife is in there and she'll text you throughout the day and stuff like a real person would text yeah yeah and man like maybe i'm maybe i'm just like not with it like maybe i'm not you know i just don't understand maybe you're a boomer maybe i'm a boomer maybe that's what it is what is that's the next thing like my kid is like Dad, I'm gonna marry this robot. Like, bro, <laughs> I'm gonna marry this robot, Dad. I'm like, I don't agree with this. And he's like, Why not? It's, she's not a real person, man. He's like, Wow, man. Like, bro, it's 2050. Like, get with the times. <laughs> uh, maybe that's like the next big thing. But I just don't think it's healthy to be. I think like intimacy with another person mm-hmm. um, is one of the most beautiful things in life. Right, and and so not everybody is fortunate enough to, um, or not everybody wants it. We're talking about monks, yeah, priests, sure, 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 right, like nuns. But like that sort of like closeness, that intimacy you feel with another person. To me, it cannot be replicated with this because it's like if this robot was truly sentient, mm-hmm. and the robot had to choose to love you. Mm-hmm then maybe I could come around a little bit. But the fact that you're you're creating this thing that has to love you, it doesn't have a choice. Mm-hmm. That's not it's not healthy, man. Like that's not, you know, and then and then if you're if you f- actually feel like all your cuz w- human beings like we have this want and need to be loved, right? And if and that's supposed to drive you to mm-hmm. essentially go out, find a partner, procreate not everyone has to do that Mm. that's okay but i feel like there's a there's like um 
a deep sense of fulfillment maybe forget about the reproduction and all that stuff but there's a deep sense of fulfillment of finding another person who didn't have to love you but chooses to yeah and if that is being fulfilled by this thing that's not real Mm -hmm. to me like that's very sad like and it takes away your drive to want to go out and find a real human yes and and you also feel like okay this thing has to accept you no matter what right so then if that's being fulfilled too there's no sense of you know i need to better myself right like that sense of um, you stagnate yeah exactly like we were talking about earlier and like that's why to me like i i think it's just really important that as a society we don't fall so deep into that even though we already are mm-hmm. you know like it's already a thing it's it's here some people um I don't want to put anyone on blast, but I've known people who is, I know this person who is now married. So congratulations. I don't feel bad talking shit, but uh, he told me and he loves his wife. He's got a daughter now, but uh, I was talking to him and he's telling me, he's like, man, I thought I was going to be one of those people who just stayed single forever, played games and had a cat. And that was just going to be it for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I was okay with that. But then he's like, but then I met, you know, my now wife and I realized like how much I was missing out on you know what I mean he's like I seriously thought I was one of those people who was going to be single forever and now he's like you know he sees that like this is so much better that this sense of fulfillment I'm not trying to judge people who are going to be single forever I'm not saying you have to be with someone but it's just like yeah I just don't it just reiterates my, my point that I don't think it's healthy to have that be fulfilled by technology yeah, I think you're right. I think the other thing, though, is um, I've, you know, the, the idea that um, people people can do what they want so long as they're not hurting anyone. That's something that I've thought about, and, I, and I've come to disagree with it completely because if I, if I love you, right, mm-hmm. if I love you as a brother and you're doing something that's not hurting anybody else, but it's hurting yourself. Yeah. But but that's that's what's part of the argument, right? Like it, it also includes yourself. Like it can't be self destructive. Yeah, but I, yes, I mean th- that would be a, that would definitely be a point of um, uh, uh, clarification. But most people don't put that clarification because okay. right? it's always like, oh, so long as Jeff is happy, you know, he can do whatever he wants. But it's like, well, look, if I love you, and I know and that what me. you're doing. <laughs> You know, and what, and you, if you just laugh, these, and you do love me. He's like, <laughs> anyways, my boy. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, if you were, if you were harm, if you were doing something that was harmful, harmful to you, I would be like, yo, listen, bro, I love you. You, sh- I don't think you should do this. Yeah. And I think I have an obligation out of love to tell you this and try to help you. Mm-hmm. But I think it's completely and utterly the opposite. If I say, yeah, yeah. I love Jeff so much. I'm gonna mm-hmm. make him go do whatever he wants, which includes hurting himself. Then, th- then I feel like that. Not I feel. I don't think that's love. You know. Yeah, I think there's levels to that, because for me, it depends on how I feel about that situation. So there's certain things that um, maybe I don't feel as strongly about that they'll do, and maybe I think it's self-destructive. But I'm also self-aware enough to know that maybe I don't know what's best for them. Yeah. So uh, I have to. Like a give, you give them a benefit of the doubt of something. Yes. Mm-hmm. Like give them the benefit of the doubt and to have the trust that they can take care of themselves. But then there's certain things that, okay, like, okay, I, I, let me give you an example of that. Like say if you, you had a friend who had a great career mm-hmm. and wanted to quit and be a fighter. Yeah. Okay. Now on paper, you, you, you're thinking, okay, st- statistically, he's probably not going to make it. Yeah. A lot of people go for this or, or maybe he wants to be a musician. Statistically, he, he's probably not going to make it. But who am I to tell them, hey, man, like, don't quit your job? Like, that's, that's like, one level of it, right? Like, I'm not going to be like, don't chase your dream because I want to believe in him. And, I, and I'm and i also, like I said, self-aware enough to know that I might not know what's best for this person. That's true. But then if it's, like, to the level where they start, you know, drinking every day and they're just like, I just like drinking every day. Mm-hmm. And you know they're doing it because they're running from something. Mm-hmm. And you try to talk to him about it and you're like, Hey man, like, I feel like, you know, you're really fucking up. 
He's like, oh, no, no, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I just like drinking. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. And then, so you, you're kind of at this point, it's like, okay, do I put this effort forward to help this person? Or do I just let it go? Because maybe it really is nothing. No, because you know that it's not like objectively almost, you know, it's hard to say objective about anything, but objectively you could almost always say that if someone is drinking every single day, getting shit faced every single day there and they have some sort of problem that they're not addressing, you can almost objectively always say that that's bad. Right. So in that situation, you can't just be like, oh, well, you know, he's not hurting anybody else. I mean, if someone's drinking every day and getting shit faced every day. Chances are they're eventually going to hurt someone. Yeah. But that's a situation where you do need to step in. Right. So there's like, there's, there's levels to that. Mm-hmm. There's, there's, um, there's sort of like a lot of nuance there. Yeah, that's true. There, there, there's quite a lot of nuance to that. And yeah, I think, I think sometimes people just say it because they think it's, it's the, it's the politically correct thing to say like, Oh, you know, I, so long as you're not hurting someone, yeah. I'll let you do it. But it's like, well, you know, sometimes you just be, you know, like for example, if, if this was, if this was an actual case, a situation, you know, talking to your friend, for example, it's going to be extremely difficult. You know, and a lot of people don't want to do something difficult. I've had to have that talk with some of my friends, man. And it's tough. It's very tough. You know, you feel like a you li- you feel like a crappy person. You feel yeah. like you're, you know, you're just imposing on people. Because you see that you're making them feel bad about themselves, and you don't like that, and you know that they don't like that. But it's not. You can't just always be. You can't just always. You know, you can't just be a yes man all the time. Mm. You you can't be an enabler. Mm. And a lot of people are like this. And some people mistaken. Are we living in an age of yes men? I would think so. Yeah, more than before. So okay, is that is is a yes man? Is that is that a simp? Have you heard that bit. term? Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. Okay, so I I don't I don't fully understand this term. So it's like uh, man, I I just googled this the other day. <laughs> you just go- <laughs> yeah, I was telling I was telling my friend like. What a simp is. I had a friend who's joking around about opening an OnlyFans account. Oh <laughs> yeah, yeah. She so she was making this joke, and then she was saying like, "Oh, but you know that'd be stupid because they could just screenshot it, yeah, and then just put it everywhere, right? Like, what's the point of paying for it?" And but I was people, like, "But apparently, people who have only fans account or fans only account, um, make a ton of money." Oh, they do. So I was telling her, "Yeah, I'm like, I mean, yeah, they people could always leak it, but simps will simp. That's what I said." Simps. And she's like, "What does that mean?" So I had to Google it because I don't really know the the, the, the you know specific definition so simp is a slang term for men who are seen as too attentive and submissive to women especially out of a failed hope of winning some entitled sexual attention or activity from them so it's like a guy who's like oh you're perfect you're beautiful oh and then you know the girl pretends like oh you know like i like you but even though they really don't okay and they're just looking at just just doing it because they want to get sex i think the guy Again, there's like a lot of nuance to this, right? But I think I think there's a lot of nuance to this uh, term simp, guys. It's almost like it's almost the same as the guys who are really into you know the the AI, whatever the waifus or whatever, mm-hmm. right? Because it's sort of like um, you know it's fake, you know, like in the back of the head, you know it's fake. You know she doesn't really like you, yeah. But you're giving her money and stuff, and she's like, "Oh my god, thank you so much, I love you." Oh, and, I yeah. see what you're saying. You see what I'm saying? Like yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. it's like the sense of fulfillment, and then like, but it's not really real. It's not real. Okay. Yeah, it's not real. She saw you and realized she'd be like, "You're gross, dude." <laughs> when was the last time you showered? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. So you kind of know that, right? Like, and it's like, and these girls know that too. They're providing. So a they're ser- just taking advantage of these men. Yeah, well, they're providing a service, and people are paying. So who am I to be like, this yeah. is wrong? But again. I don't think it's healthy. Okay. So what did you tell your friend? Oh, the, my friend? Yeah. Um, it was a friend of mine who... Like, do it or don't do it? Do, do what? The OnlyFans account. Oh, oh, okay. That friend. <laughs> I thought you were talking about the other friend. Okay. No, no, no. She was just joking. Okay. But if she did, I'd be like, whatever, man. Like, I'm not here to judge. But Can people make OnlyFans account with their with their feet? And be like, yo, OnlyFans account for my feet. Probably. There's some, there's like some girl who sells her shit on. What? Yeah, it's fucking gross, <laughs> man. I don't even like. 
I don't care how much I like the girl. Like, if she comes over and, like, she doesn't flush properly, oh, my God. <laughs> no. This is a big no-no for anyone no. who's listening if you're wanting to date Jeff. Yeah, let alone selling her shit online. Like, who, like, what kind of gross, man. Again, I'm I'm trying not I'm really trying not to judge because whatever, right? Like they're consenting adults and she's making money, but that's gross, man. Like I don't know. That's disgusting. I think that's if you're a, if you're a guy who's spending money to get a jar of shit from a girl online, I think you really need to reevaluate your life. Mm-hmm. That's yeah, that's absolutely disgusting. I don't know why anyone would buy a jar of crap just People are weird, man, and they're nuanced. That's, yep, that's, <laughs> I, don't, I have no clue what to say. Okay, this is, all this talk about, I, I have to use the bathroom again. <laughs> I've drank a lot of water. Do it, so. do it, go, do it, go, okay. go for it. <laughs> okay, I'm back. So I actually found that article that I was telling you about, about the uh, university professors who are working with pro-pedophile charities. Okay. Pro-pedophile charities. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's on the post-millennial. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but maybe I was wrong about the, the earlier professor that I mentioned, but I'm pretty sure he's in this article. But I didn't know one of the articles, uh, one of the professors apparently is uh, Dr. Sykes Stevens, who's from St. Mary's University, which is my alma, alma mater. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'll send you this. I'll send you this thing later. But yeah, anyways, I mean, who would buy? Who honestly? Who? Uh, well, yeah, I don't know which guy would buy a pile of crap, you know, from the girl that they are super attracted to. I don't, you know, there's nothing really attract attractive about crap. Some people are into that. Actually, I know a guy who takes. Who, I know too many weird people. Don't judge me, guys. <laughs> but I didn't know he was this weird when I first met him. If this you're listening like to this, I'm not going to mention your name, but if you're listening to this, it's okay, man. Like whatever. Nobody knows who you Nobody are. Knows. So Nobody knows. But I still care about you and hope you have a good life. Yeah, but and if we ever meet, just just say, I'm the guy. And then I'll know. <laughs> <laughs> but he was, um, he was explaining to me. I don't think he'll mind if I tell you, but he was explaining to me why he likes that. Mm-hmm. And he was saying how he just likes seeing something that he really likes so in this case like an attractive girl get defiled by something really gross so in this in this case like human feces wait 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 he likes like he likes the contrast okay so if he finds a girl super attractive he also likes it even more when there's something um something super like an ex- like their excrement as well. It makes it even more. Yeah, because it, it, it's it's it. it's gross. That's why it's like this idea. It's the contrast. Like he 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 likes like the, yeah, it's gross. So if you like if this, super but that's why he likes girl. it because it's gross. Oh okay okay. Because so. it's like that contrast. It's like something he really likes. So, so it's so. like the opposite of you then, because you like. <laughs> what do I like? <laughs> you like girls who flush. <laughs> oh, definitely. Yeah, I like girls with hygiene. Okay. <laughs> I like girls who take care of themselves. I like, I, like, I like girls who look back on the toilet and make sure that they didn't leave me a surprise <laughs> when I go in there. Okay? Man, you know what, though? Um, but it, you were saying, you know, our, our culture seems to be very uh, yes, man. And something that I, I wanted to bring, the, bring, bring, the, bring up with you mm-hmm. uh, was with specifically about guns mm-hmm. in Canada. Yeah. Right, we had the uh, uh, the liberal government put through a ban, a massive list of guns yes. that they banned, and a lot of gun owners like yourself, like yep. friends of mine, yep, were very upset. They were yep. they were very upset with the bill, and you know, I prior to that there were, I, I believe, a, a petition that was looking to sign like twenty thousand people. I'm pretty sure it's a bit more than twenty thousand people, and it was all failed, but nothing happened. And then the bill came out, and obviously the bill came out in like what is it a week in the span of a week after yep. the mass murdered, um, the the mass shooting in Nova Scotia. Yes, unfortunate. And it, and it went, they you know they took that they took advantage of that situation. Yep. There's a catalyst. Yeah. Um, okay, so here's the thing. 
I just want to clarify that I am not particularly pro gun. I do own firearms um, because I'm in the sport of shooting, and I also am in the process of learning how to hunt uh, because I want to eventually source my own food. Um, I also don't own any firearms that are on this list, so I don't really even have any personal stake in this bill. It doesn't affect me. Mm. But I will say is that I think it's bullshit because it's a, it's a knee jerk emotional reaction and I'll explain why I feel that way. So a lot of people think because Canadian society is so, I don't want to say obsessed, but very intertwined with American culture mm -hmm. that we often look at our neighbors to the South and we think, you know, oh, we're just like them. And a lot of people who might be ignorant towards some of our laws think that we have the same situation as they do in the States, which is just not the case. A lot of Canadians. A lot of Canadians think this. And the Liberal government, who I'm not even like particularly against, I think there's things they do wrong and I think there's things that they do right. But in this case, I think it was a knee-jerk reaction and I think it was a case of pandering because a lot of people are ignorant about our gun laws. Mm -hmm. So they think... You know, they think about, you know, in the States, uh, they have their Second Amendment. And, you know, it's like, it's your right to bear arms. Now, I want to be clear. I don't think it's anyone's right to have a firearm. Because it's not your right to drive a car. Why is it your right to have a firearm? Mm -hmm. right? What if it's a spear that you make for yourself? And I think, I think, I think if you live within a society where you are protected under those laws they have the right to tell you what you can and can't have to some degree to some degree okay you're allowed to have spears in canada just to be clear really yeah of course you can I order it off that. amazon it can be here by tomorrow <laughs> i i honestly didn't know that yeah you're, you're but you can't have non chucks you can't have non chucks that's just stupid and or uh the brass knuckles you can't have brass knuckles yeah <laughs> stupid but anyways and you can't have ninja stars <laughs> yeah but you can have spears and guns this is why, okay, so in our country here in Canada, there's already a lot of restrictions when it comes to our firearms, but the government's trying to paint this narrative that it's not the case. They're trying to paint this narrative that we have this, you know, free for all Wild West system as they do in the States, mm -hmm. and it's, it's just not the case. So in Canada, um, you can break this down to be more granular, but to be more specific, like generic rather, um, you can kind of break it down to three classes. So we have uh, unrestricted, which is the license that I have. Mm -hmm. You have restricted, and then you have prohibited. So unrestricted is typically your rifles and shotguns. So typically this is stuff that you would be using to hunt um, or to target practice. And then you have your prohibited. So this is, sorry, not prohibited, restricted. So this is, the, I can't speak too much on this because I don't have this license, so I don't know all the nuances of it, but it's basically a class of firearms that they deem that civilians typically don't need for any sort of sporting activities. So this is stuff like handguns mm. um, because you're not going to hunt with a handgun. Um, it's certain rifles that they deem to be too tactical and excuse me, some stuff that maybe they think the caliber is too high. And then you have prohibited. So this is just flat out, you can't own it. Um, yeah, so even if you have a license, you can't own these kind of type of guns. So what they did with this bill was essentially they moved a bunch of stuff, not just from restricted, but from unrestricted straight into the prohibited class. And the reason they did this is because they're trying to paint this narrative that we have uh, military, they call it military style assault weapons. Yes, yes. Those don't exist. That. What in, does that in, mean? In this, it doesn't mean anything. It's a term they made up. So people think of, okay, so you take an AR-15, for example. And that, that, that was one of the, the weapons yes. they were using. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so what, what makes an AR-15 so dangerous? Um, it takes a lot of bullets. It takes a lot of rounds. So, so a typical AR-15 round, I believe, is, I mean, I don't own an AR-15, so, but I believe it's 25 to 30, mm -hmm. the typical magazine for an AR-15 is 25 to 30 rounds. So if I'm correct, if I'm incorrect, I apologize, but it's, it's, it's not, it's in that ballpark. And so you have, you know, 25 to 30 rounds that you can shoot at a very fast rate. 
So this results in you being able to kill a lot of people in a sh- very short period of time. Mm. Are you allowed before this bill? Were you allowed to have an AR-15 in Canada? Um, so yes and no. Wasn't it clipped? So, so in AR-15, depending on the model, there's a lot of nuance that I'm not going to go into, but there's versions of the AR-15 that do the exact same thing in the unrestricted and the restricted class. But in both classes of firearms, you can only have five rounds. You can only have five rounds in the magazine. So like I said, like when you say you can only have, it means like the magazine itself can't load more than five. You cannot put more than five rounds in these magazines. It's it's literally, it's like clipped off. And this is true for all firearms that are not pistols. So your shotgun can only take five rounds. Your rifles can only take five rounds. Doesn't matter if you own a Browning uh, bolt action; mm-hmm. it takes five rounds. Uh, well, depending actually depending on the action. So if it's a semi-automatic, it takes five rounds. Okay, this so is, here's, this, here's the thing with the semi. What is a semi-automatic? So a, semi-auto- a semi-automatic is um, any firearm that is so as you it fires as fast as you can pull the trigger. So with an AR-15, which is semi-automatic, it's not fully automatic. And by the way, we don't have any full, fully automatic firearms in Canada. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, what well, we do, but they're not available to civilians. They're already they're already prohibited. They're for military. Yeah. But with a semi-automatic, you can still do a lot of damage, which is what makes these guns so dangerous, right? But they're already pinned to five rounds, just but, like any other firearm that's semi-automatic. So what makes an AR-15 so dangerous in Canada? Hmm. Like, why are we spending... This is my problem with it, right? I don't really care if I can't have an AR-15, but why are we spending like over a billion dollars to get rid of these guns that are already already altered to only mm. shoot five rounds? Right. So people make the okay. So people make the even when I tell people that people make the argument. Well, you know, um, it's a combat rifle. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's it's a high power round. No, it's not. Um, it, it is a combat rifle. And yeah, the round is used by the military, but I would much rather get shot with an AR-15 than say a hunting rifle. The AR-15 uses two, two, three Remington. Um, there's a, and, and this round is, it's too small to even hunt deer with because, because it's, it's not, it's not high powered enough. It's not, it's not a big enough round. This is the AR-15. This is the AR-15, two, two, three Remington. If I took an AR-15 bullet and I put it next to say, you know, a 308 Winchester, you, 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 you would be like, wow, like that. It's, it's such a small bullet. It's, it's not, you know, it's not any more high powered than other calibers close to that. And it's certainly not more high powered than what is typically used to hunt deer, Mm -hmm. which are still perfectly legal. So realistically, the reason why they're banning these guns is because they look scary. Now, after the shooting in Montreal that happened, that Nova massacre, Scotia, Nova, Nova Scotia, no, in Montreal, last year, the, no, no, this was years ago. Remember oh, okay, when, yeah, when sorry, they went sorry. to the women's college? When this yep. one guy went to the women's college, I, I read about that. He used a mini Ruger, which is basically an AR-15, uh-huh. except it, it has a wood stock. I believe the one he used had a wood stock. It looks more like a hunting rifle, but it takes the same kind of magazine as an AR-15. So after that. In Canada, we said, you know, enough is enough. Whether you agree with that or not, that's what we did. We said enough is enough. Um, These magazines are only allowed to take 30 rounds, sorry, five rounds at a time. And, uh, you know, that effectively has taken out the advantage of an AR-15. Like, what what is the other advantage? So you, you have this gun that the major advantage is it holds a lot of bullets. It can't, it doesn't hold that many bullets anymore. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't hold any bullets. It holds five, just like any other semi-automatic. Some semi-automatics that have even more. I can talk about this for a long time because there's a lot of nuance to this, but I'm trying not to get too into it. But so effectively, it's just a low-powered semi-automatic rifle like any other gun. What about the argument that the AR-15, like these weapons are are used used to use for criminal activities. So that's the thing, right? Like most of the most of the guns that are being used in criminal activities are coming from across the border from the US illegally. Illegally. So why are we targeting legal gun owners who already have like 
this nerfed version of the gun. Okay. Uh, okay. So he banned, I don't want to say he, they banned a, like, you know, a huge number of guns. So it's right? a massive list. It's a massive list. It's not just the air. There's also an airsoft in there. There's also an airsoft gun. And this is just the weirdest non-comprehensive list I've ever <laughs> seen in my life. And, and a coffee company. Yeah. And a coffee company, black rifle. Yeah. Um, but, but the other thing is they're banning stuff based on the name, yeah. but functionally speaking, there's, you know, dozens of guns on the market that still do the same thing. Mm. The T97 is essentially an AR-15. It takes the same magazine, okay. shoots, it's it's semi-automatic. Of course, it takes a five-round magazine. Well, like, it's even black and scary, like mm. the AR-15. So, like, why is that still legal? Mm. The Tavor, same thing, takes an AR-15, uh, same magazine. You have the Canadian version of the AR-15, which almost looks exactly like an AR-15 that remains unrestricted. Um, I forgot the name of the gun. And then you have, you know, bigger calibers, but it's not, they're not, they're not being banned based on the caliber. They're, ba they're being banned based on the model and the model functionally speaking does the exact same thing as these guns that are still legal. Mm -hmm. So what this is, it's, it's sort of like, it's, it's, it's a performative build. So it's, it's painting this narrative that, oh, our party is doing everything it can to stop gun violence. And to me, that's cheap. That's really cheap because they're not, this is not going to do anything. So it's it's a, it's a, you're targeting legal gun owners. Yeah, and this guy in Nova Scotia who, who Gabriel Wartman. Yes. He didn't even attain his firearms legally. They weren't even legal firearms. Yeah, that's what I read. Yes. Okay, so there's a lot of conspiracy theories about him now. That he was a CI for the RCMP because yeah. he took out four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Yes. From from a bank. Yeah. Just like walked in and took it out. Yeah, and it, and it's and it's a service that's only available to CIs um, or special agents. So, yeah, that's that's weird. And it's like, how was he able to... So all the guns he used was, are, are, are already not available to civilians. Hmm. So why are we having this knee-jerk reaction by banning all these guns that are available to civilians that he didn't use, are not, are not on the same... Like, you know, like it's just... It doesn't make any sense. And it's like, what... And, and I think it's just really cheap because it's easy to do that. It's easy to pass this bill. Well, it's not easy, but it's a lot easier than actually trying to like curb yeah the hard part is trying to stop these illegal guns from coming in the hard part is trying to stop criminals from getting their hands on illegal firearms of course it's hard to get legal gun orders to, to give their firearms over but it's a lot easier to get legal firearm owners than criminals to give up their guns mm -hmm. so it's like you're almost creating this sacrificial lamb but it's not even really making our country any safer. Mm -hmm. In what way is, our, is, it, is it making our country that's what, safer? That's what I was wondering. Because, you know, some, there were, I saw so many people, man, so many people who were pro. They're like, this is the best decision that the Canadian government has done. You know, we're not like the Americans. We care about our people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're like, I'm glad we finally banned these guns. And I was thinking, well, I mean... If you if if you if we were really targeting you know um, criminal activities, you would be going after the criminals and not the legal gun owners. Who, I mean, Gabriel Wartman, because this was all based off what happened with him, right? And like you were saying, he wasn't even his guns weren't even legal, or at least, yeah, it wasn't even legal to own because he wasn't even an RCMP. He wasn't even no. military. No, uh, it's not clear how he got his firearms, but you can't walk into a store and buy what he had. So, like. Yeah, like it's it's a it seems like a performative bill. Yes, you're like, hey guys, look at us, we're doing so good. Yeah, it's 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 based off of people's ignorance when it comes to Canadian gun laws. So to even get okay, so let's talk about the law. So I have an unrestricted license. Just for an unrestricted license, the very basic license you can get. Mm -hmm. Okay, just for this license. I had to go to a firearm safety course. I had to take a written test. I had to take a practical test. Mm -hmm. Then when I passed both tests, I had papers confirming that I passed, which I then had to mail in to the RCMP. They then, they then ran a background check on me mm -hmm. and, and I had to have references. So oh, I had to have references. Yes, I had to have people who knew me to make sure I wasn't fucking crazy. Okay. And they did a criminal record check on me. They run a complete comprehensive background check on you. Yeah. So if you have anything, they can deny you. If you have a history of mental health, yeah. 
um, if you have any criminal activity or your references don't check out, they will refuse your license. Mm. Three months later, sometimes longer, sometimes four or five months, they send this license back to you. Now you can get a firearm. This is the most basic level of firearm license that you can acquire mm-hmm. in this country. Okay, so the next list, the, the the other license is the restricted license. Can you uh, you you are able to get that? If you I'm able to, to get it, but I'm not interested in getting anything on that list. So it's just like two hundred bucks. I'd rather not spend. Um, it's basically the same process. Okay, you go in, you take a test. Um, you take a practical and a written test. You pass your background check, whatever, right? Have some references. But the major difference is um, the the in terms of the law uh, when you actually own your firearm. So you can't walk into a store and just give them your... So with the unrestricted, I can walk into a store. I give them my license. Mm-hmm. I'm like, hey, I want this one. They'll, re- they'll, they'll register it. Like, well, not register. They don't register it under your name per se. But they'll put it into the system and they'll run all the paperwork in the back. So it takes, you know, maybe like half an hour. Some, sometimes faster than that. Sometimes 15 minutes, depending on the person doing it. So you can walk out of the store in like half an hour with an unrestricted firearm. If you have a license and no, you know, criminal but history. That's still like 15 to 30 minutes of you being checked out. Yeah. Like, so you've already been checked by the RCMP. You've already taken your firearm safety course. You've already taken your practical course. Like, you're you've already been checked out but when you buy this gun they still run paperwork on it right so that's rel- relatively hassle free if you want a restricted firearm when you take your license in um you can't take that gun home with you it's it, they have to they have to register it okay and, and i'm not 100 percent certain about all the details just because i don't have this license but you can't take the gun home with you they have to they have to hold on to it for a certain amount of time. I want to say twenty four hours, but I'm not sure. Um, Is that just so that you fully fully check out? It's just to, it's just to make yeah it, it's it's just to give it a, a bit of a you know it's just that extra level of safety yeah yeah. And then on top of that, you cannot transport this weapon without informing the police. So every time you take it to the range, you have to you have to register online. Hey, this, on, on this day, you have to inform the police. On this day, I'm taking this firearm to the range you're not allowed to shoot it anywhere except on the range so you can't take it hunting you can't shoot it in your backyard well you, you shouldn't you, you can't shoot guns in your backyard depending on your bylaw but let's say you have a let's say you have a giant peat chunk of land out in the middle of nowhere yeah. you, you, you can't you can't shoot you can't shoot um restricted firearms yeah. and then on top of that uh on top of that it's like you can't even stop like you can't you have to go from point a to point b done okay yeah. you can't take like a detour you can't you have to take the exact route that you told them you're gonna take mm, i see so there's already all this you know like there's, there's already, already all, very uh what's the word um very strict yes. in what you can do and how you can transport this thing and i think as of maybe <sighs> two years ago mm-hmm. i I don't rem- again I don't have this license so I'm not 100% certain but I know that you can't even buy a firearm in that class now unless you have a membership with the range oh. to show that hey I want this gun because I'm actually going to practice with it not okay. because you know like you have to have a reason and that's your reason you have a you have, you have to have a range membership okay that makes sense because I have a friend that just went and got his range membership mm-hmm. so so it, there's a lot of hoops you have to jump through so to me, it just wasn't worth it. I'm not interested in any firearms in that class. But even though, even still, the um, what, what class do you have? Unrestricted. Unrestricted. Even when you're carrying that, you have to carry it in a very strict manner, right? You can't just you, carry you, it. You you can okay. So when you're transporting it, an un, unrestricted firearm, uh, a restricted firearm, I believe it always has to be locked in a case. Yes. And the magazine yeah. has to be separate. An unrestricted because you can go hunting with it. Yeah. You are allowed to transport it without a lock. Okay. Because when you're hunting, you're transporting it without a lock. But okay. you have to be able to use it. Is there are there any restrictions on whether it has to be encased or not? Uh, not if you're not if you're tending to it. But if you're in the car, like if you're in the car, yeah, that's fine. Because you're, you're tending to it. I see. Okay. But if you're but if it's in your house, it has to be locked up. Oh. Okay. okay it has to be unloaded. Um, you're allowed to have it on display if it's if there's a trigger lock on it or if you remove the firing pin. 
So let's say you want to put up like a yeah. historical rifle, so. you can take out the firing pin so it's incapable of going off. Yeah. Um, and they're very strict with this kind of stuff. Like if you store it in a certain way where they have reason to believe that you have quick ac- access to it. Like under your pillow or something? What's that? Like oh, under yeah, your pillow. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Like if you store it in a way where they have suspicion that you have that for home defense, because we're not allowed to do that in Canada. You're not allowed to defend your home with your firearm. So if you store it in a way where they were, okay, yeah, it's locked, but it was really easy for you to unlock and yeah. use, they'll charge you. Sometimes it's it's like nonsensical how they charge you. Sometimes they'll charge you. Um, so if you have a, if you have your gun and then you have ammo mm-hmm. that's really close to it, mm-hmm. there was a guy who was charged and the ammo wasn't even the same caliber, but they charged him anyways. Uh, but how did they even find it in the first place? I'm not sure. But they charged them. They said this fire, this fire, this this ammunition is being stored, unlocked, too close to your locked firearm. Even though it's not the proper ammunition. Yeah, it's not. Even though it can't even go into the gun. So it's already very strict. It's very strict. There's been there's been instances where a guy was, um, so these guys were setting his lawn on fire, and he went into his firearms uh, locker. And he loaded up a, uh, one of his firearms and he came outside and he shot into the air. Yeah. Not at them, uh, in the air. These guys ran off. They're trying to set his house on fire. And they charged him because they said... They charged the guy yeah. who's protecting his yeah. Fo- land. Yeah. Because they said... Because um, you have a right to defend yourself in this country, right? So they try to get you alter- in an alternative kind of way. They'll be like well, how are you able to unlock your firearms and load it that fast? You must have not been storing it properly. If though they weren't even there. Like the, the, the people yeah, charging that's, that's how they try there. to get you. I don't, know, I don't know how that case turned out, but this is the kind of stuff that happens, you know, and it's like, and, and I think it's good. I, I, I take firearm safety very, very seriously. And I think everyone should, though. Everyone should. So when I see in the States, because it's a right, I see some people with zero tr- trigger discipline. They're just waving this gun around. You know, they'll sweep a room and like they kind of like point it at their friend by accident, you know, <laughs> like, have you seen this? Have you seen this? Uh, this thing that's viral right now? It's like Ken and Karen. Oh, yes. I, the it? guy with the uh, rifle and then yeah, the woman's yeah. holding a pistol like this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what bothered me so much is she has no trigger discipline. I mean, that that whole thing is pretty messed up. But just the fact that she's holding this gun with her finger in the trigger, like in the trigger guard. Yeah. It's like, and she's just waving it around at people, yeah, like including her husband. She's like, kind of like accidentally points at him a few times. I'm like, I, I, I pray that that gun is not loaded. Yeah. Because if you accidentally kill someone, my goodness, I don't care if like, you yeah. know, what the situation is. You, you, if you accidentally discharge a firearm and kill another human being. Yeah. So I take fire, firearm safety very, very seriously. And yeah, I just, you know, when it comes to this bill, I just think it's, um, if they took away these guns, mm-hmm. which, by the way, they didn't really even take away because there's plenty of stuff on the market that does the exact same thing. Okay. So no okay, matter what see. angle you look at this, it doesn't make any sense. Right. You're taking away guns, but you're keeping guns that do the exact same thing. Right. But you, we, yeah, Jeff, don't give them any ideas, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but... It, it, it's, it's very performative. Mm-hmm. So you look at it, and if you look at it in the perspective, like, oh, but, like, functionally... You know, we don't want these, like, there's no reason for a civilian to have, you know, a military weapon. They're not military. What, what are you talking about? Mm-hmm. They only hold five rounds. Yeah. What like, What kind of, mil- do you know why the military don't use those guns? Because they suck. Like, you, you would lose if you if you went into battle with those, with those firearms. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's just taking money away from our economy. Because now, okay, so now the program is that you can trade it back. To give you money for it well there's no buyback program right now so so what they're doing is they're doing a ban on it so it's like um you can't shoot the so you you're allowed to have it on you but you can't shoot you, it you can't shoot it you can't transport it it's effectively dead weight the event they said they, they promised that eventually there will be a buyback program what are they going to do with, even if they buy back destroy them come on they're going to destroy them so it's like we're going to throw away you know well over a billion dollars for like a performance a narrative yeah that's what i'm not okay with again like i'm not super pro gun i don't think owning a gun is your right i think it's like driving a car Mm -hmm. it's a it's a privilege but what if we take guns and then we just 
replace the word guns with weapons. So if we, let's go back, you know, like thousands of years, we're living in a tribe. You know, obviously the right languages aren't even available at that point. But the the idea of me owning something to protect myself and to go hunting would be a spear, um, a bow, an arrow, uh, perhaps a knife or a big machete. You know, those are weapons. Mm -hmm. And guns, we could, you know, guns... Guns right now are just a, a modernization of bows, bows and arrows, right? Uh, just a very modern bow and arrow. So in that sense, won't you say that we have a right in that sense? Don't think, don't think like modern weapons, just think okay. like weapons. I think it's your right to own whatever you please. But when you live in a society where we benefit from the system that they have in place, they have some say into what you are and are not allowed to own. Mm. It's not written written in our Canadian constitution. Like, I don't believe, like I said, I don't believe it's a right to own a firearm, but I can also see the from the perspective of someone who lives in the States where it's written into their constitution. We, that's not the case in Canada. Mm -hmm. So I think we don't have as strong of a case to say you are or not or are not allowed to have this specific firearm. Um, like I said, if you were, if you were like, if you were, you know, like if you weren't benefiting from the Canadian government, the laws and the systems that we have in place, um, they would have no right to tell you what you can and can't have. Mm -hmm. But because you and I, all of us, we benefit, uh, you know, we benefit, I, I think, uh, pretty drastic. It's a pretty drastic benefit that we have living in this society that if the government tells us, you can't have this there's there's some semblance of okay that makes sense to me but my problem is this is not based in reality this is a decision that's not based in practicality it's based on it's an emotional response mm -hmm. that doesn't make any sense yeah and if anybody if if somebody had all the facts so if they knew everything that i knew i would say they're hard pressed to make the argument that this bill makes any sense. Mm. It's just that they don't have that information. So they're just thinking like, Oh man, like we're just getting rid of, um, you know, uh, military assault rifles. That's not, it's just not the case. Yeah. The other thing that people need to understand is that a lot of this 1500 guns, so-called 1500 that he's banning. Mm -hmm. I keep saying he, but the liberal party, no offense, Justin, <laughs> but the, the ban it's a lot of these guns they are already not available so they artificially add, added all these guns that they were already not available some of them are already banned some okay. of them are so obscure that no one's ever even really heard of them like i had to google half of these and when i looked them up it was like i could barely find any documentation on them hmm. they banned stuff that weren't even guns they, yeah. they banned an airsoft rifle they banned a website all to artificially pump this number up to 1,500. Yeah, to make it seem like this massive, like, look at us, we're yeah. banning all these guns that are... But realistically, they banned maybe a few hundred. And even then, a lot of them are, are, are alternate versions of the same rifle. Mm -hmm. And even then, there's many different versions of those guns that are on the list that are still available mm -hmm. to consumers. Some of them in the unrestricted class. So like, what is the, like, what, what, what's the argument here? Mm -hmm. Like, why are we like, I'm not even that against, you know, but it's, but it's just like, we're going to throw away over a billion dollars. That's what we're going to do at yeah. a time when our country is already headed into an economic disaster. It's, it's, it was just a very much a knee jerk reaction. And it's like, and I think I understand where they're coming from. Right. Cause I think they kind of back themselves into a hole. Mm -hmm. I think, um, if you recall when they first said we're going to we're going to have stricter gun control it was when you know trudeau came like all that blackface stuff right before the election mm -hmm. came out so they needed something controversial and hard hitting so what did they do the next day they have a press conference talking about remember it and they just they have they left all the nuance out of it all they said was conservatives are for looser gun laws and liberals are for tighter gun laws. They're kind of preying on people's ignorance and their lack of knowledge and also our 
you know, I will, I'll say it like obsession with American culture. Mm. It is true. Yeah. And it's like, they're playing off of that to kind of get hit the eyeballs off of the fact that, you know, Justin Trudeau used to do blackface. And again, like I don't hate Justin Trudeau. Okay. We used to be neighbors. (laughs) I used to live down the street from him. Okay. I've seen him a few times. He's a very handsome man, but this kind of like emotional pandering, Mm to me is not okay it, it it's like and it's working that's what that's what's bothering which, me which is quite sad that it's working they're preying off of people's ignorance and that's not to say like you know justin trudeau is the devil he's horrible i think there's some things he does right but i just think in this case specifically and also a lot of things that happened in his first term it made me lose faith in him as a very genuine person because I think there's certain politicians I look at that I don't agree with. For example, Bernie Sanders. I don't believe, I disagree with a lot of stuff Bernie Sanders says. But I truly believe that man believes everything he says. Mm-hmm. Even when he's talking about gun control, all that kind of stuff. You know, it, it's not it's not the it's not the content of his words. It's it's really the his the, actions. Yeah, like yeah. How, like how how convicted he is in his own ideology. Yeah. But I feel like a politician is kind of like a chameleon. You know what I mean? Like I licks their mean. finger and sees which way the wind's yes. blowing. But that, that is the case with most politicians. With most well. politicians. You know, I think uh, there's, there's a, um, have you ever heard, heard of the Hammurabi code? No. What's that? Okay. So the Hammurabi code, and I obviously I might butch, uh, butch, 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 <laughs> I might botch this, but the Hammurabi code is a code that was written. And it basically states that someone, um, if you're an architect mm-hmm. or an engineer, yeah. you have a ring on, right? Because Jeff is an engineer. I mean, this is a perfect example, actually. So the Hammurabi Code basically says, look, if you're an architect and then you build a house mm-hmm. and the owner of the house, while living in the house that you built or, or is using a bridge that you built, the bridge collapses or the house that you built collapses and the owner is killed, you will be killed as well. Okay, yeah, I've heard of that. So the point is that what you say, you you have you have basically have to preach. Uh, you have to do what you preach. You have to talk the walk. You have to walk the talk, right? So it puts their skin in the game. So now, if I say, no, you know, if I say, oh Jeff, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of something. You should do jujitsu. Jujitsu is so good. You know, it makes you healthy. Everyone should do jujitsu, mm-hmm. but I don't do jujitsu, right? Or I say, hey, Jeff, you should you should go out to the gap. There's a Ottawa River swim. You know, do the swim every day. It's great for you. And then I never do it. You know, I have, the, I, okay. I have no skin in the game. So the Hammurabi code obviously puts the skin and you as an engineer, part of why you wear that ring is so that you, if I remember correctly, so you can correct me since you're the engineer here. But from what I understand, part of the reason why you wear the ring is so that you have integrity in the work that you do. Yep. Right? Yep. So that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, but yeah, I think politicians, that's the problem, right? They don't have a lot of skin in the game. Yeah. And that's, and they should though. They should. They should. It, I mean, I, I think I, Andrew Yang, for example. I, mm. this it is funny when you were saying that we have an obsession with American politics. Yeah, American politics is so globalized. Like people in New Zealand care about American politics now. Partially, maybe that's because the American yeah. have so much soft power with Hollywood. But Indians, like in India, they yeah. care about American politics. Oh, Canada, in China, they do. Hundred percent. Like Australia, yeah. you know, it's all over the place. Yep. Um, it's probably the most important election on the planet. Yeah. Like every, it's, it's so true. I mean, like our own election with the one that just happened with Justin Trudeau yeah. had the black face, brown face. And then people were like, yeah, you know, people make mistakes. And I understand, you know, of course people make mistakes. hundred percent people make mistakes. But if you have skin in the game and you'd been telling people, you know, you're a racist because you said some word or you're a racist because... 10 years ago you put on a black face and yeah. then turns out that you had it on you, you know this you is know. this is the problem i think especially now there's a lot of people you know cancel culture mm-hmm. there's a lot of people being canceled based on something stupid they did 10 years ago and you know 10 years was not long ago that was 2010 yeah but it's still 10 years it's 10 years ago i i think it's it man it's what's that quote in the bible let he who let you judge which one? The one where Sin cast the first stone. What is it? 
<laughs> now you're putting me on the spot. Come on, man. Uh, let he who let, like let Jesus who, said. Oh yeah, let, well, when he's talking to the Pharisees, yeah. if you've if you've not sinned, be the let he who has never sinned be the first one to cast the stone. Yeah, yeah. Here's the thing, right? Like, you well, you never told edgy jokes like ten years ago. It's just we're lucky enough. I, I mean, I have. I see some shit that pops up in my Facebook memories, and I just cringe. <laughs> God, why did I say that? And I'm fortunate enough, ironically, we were kind of talking about, you know, influence and power yeah. earlier with social media. I'm fortunate enough that nobody gives a fuck what I said yeah. 10 years ago. I've said a lot of stupid shit in my life and I, I'll, I'll own it. I'll own up to it. Mm-hmm. But if I somehow built this great life for myself and then people are trying to take me down based on what I said when I was a teenager, I mean, you know, like even, even Justin Trudeau with his blackface, um, Everyone's, including Andrew. I know you like Andrew Shear, okay? I, I, well, let's be let's be very clear. I don't necessarily like him. Okay, I, I, I actually, I'm not a very big fan of okay. Andrew Shear. I don't I don't agree with his politics, but he seems like a very nice, sweet person. Uh, he is or, a very nice when, person when he talks. Okay, yeah, yeah. But I don't I don't agree with him. I think my views align more with Trudeau, ironically, even though I dis- I really disagree with a lot of stuff that Trudeau does and the way he goes about it. Mm-hmm. Um. But I will say I will say this, right? It's like Andrew Shu was trying to kind of trying to dunk on Trudeau with the blackface thing when he was like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like Andrew Shear was like, well, you know, like we always knew it was wrong. I was like, Andrew Shear, man, stop. There's going to be a picture of you that comes out dressed like freaking Kobe Bryant. <laughs> it's going to be game over because everybody did it, man. Yeah. Like a lot of white people did it back in the day. And it wasn't like, why are we pretending like, we always knew it was a horrible thing. I think everybody always thought it was kind of like, especially minorities when people dressed up like Asian people, mm-hmm. you know, people did that shit all the time when I was growing up mm-hmm. or, or, or people just like, it, you felt like it was insensitive, mm-hmm. especially if they're, they're kind of exaggerating the negative parts of uh, negative stereotypes about you. Like they'll, they'll paint their eyes super small or they'll yeah. walk around. You know what I mean? And they'll have like buck teeth. Yeah. I got great teeth by the way. Yeah. I'm just saying I never had braces. I'm lucky like that. But that's like it, it was hurtful in a way back then but you didn't really care that much you weren't like this is the worst thing ever you know and so we didn't really make it clear that hey we don't like that and it wasn't society didn't frown upon it the way they do now yeah. so to pretend like oh i always knew it was wrong i always knew this is a horrible thing no no you didn't mm-hmm. like why are we pretending like i'm not excusing what he did but i don't think it was malicious Mm-hmm. The no, it's I, and, and I don't know if it was malicious. And I probably would say that it wasn't malicious. Like he wasn't trying to. I would bet my life on the fact that it wasn't malicious. But that's the thing, though. I think that's. I think the problem is just like you were saying with these politicians. They're more like chameleons now. Yeah. They're just like, oh, let's see where. Like the best example is the uh, the mayor of Ottawa. Yeah. You know, <laughs> Jim Watson. Jim Watson. Yeah. yeah. I've heard from multiple people who've lived in Ottawa. Okay way longer than I have have said yeah Jim Watson is basically some is is basically someone who will say yes to whatever the culture is saying yes to and say no to whatever the culture at that point in time is saying no to and he's just he's that sort of politician yeah so well, Hillary Clinton's like that too <laughs> Hillary yes she is she, you know yeah man Hillary Clinton if you watch the uh, old interviews of Hillary Clinton when Bill Clinton was being accused of um, what's that called sexual misconduct yeah and I she's like i have sex with that woman <laughs> yeah. i have a terrible uh bill but clinton she she, she she was defending bill clinton yeah. she's like oh we you shouldn't believe uh monica monica you know we can't believe yeah. but then now she comes out with all these other you know cases she's like you have to believe the woman yeah. no matter what it's like well if we're going by your own logic yeah like what, what are we doing here yeah 100 percent. i mean this is this is what it means to be a politician right you gotta you you have to stick your finger in the wind and see which way it's blowing. And it shouldn't be that way. No, it shouldn't be that way. But it, but it's like you're not gonna make it in politics unless you you know you gotta read the room a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. And like this is this is the problem, right? Like I I just think we can't hold people to our standards today because we weren't perfect people back then either. We're not perfect people today. Like I'm not so arrogant to think that my opinions is are, is 100 percent correct like I, i'm willing to listen to people and to, to to hear people out maybe i'm wrong about something mm-hmm. and they'll enlighten me and after hearing what they have to say i'll say to myself okay like i was wrong and then 
now I am, you know. But you can you can you know it becomes very difficult to do that in and when you're in the public limelight, you know, you think, man, I gotta be, I gotta have all the right answers. Yeah, you know, people people don't forgive very easily nowadays, and forgiveness is something that's very very important. Mm. This is a this is a problem I have with my family. Okay, so when I was growing up, my family maybe it's part of our culture, but like Asian people are very proud. Okay, to the point where we never want to be wrong. So. When I was growing up with my family, it was always like no one would ever admit they were wrong. And I kind of grew up like that. Like I would never admit I'm wrong because it's like it's if you admit you're wrong. What's that? Was it seen as a sign of weakness? Yeah, it's like you're admitting defeat. Hmm. So my family, like my family never admits, like even if they're clearly wrong, they'll never admit it. And I got to a certain age, right, to where it's just like I was always so defensive. You yeah. know, I think up until I was maybe like 17, 18, I was very defensive. Even when I knew I was wrong. You know what I mean? Like someone pulled this shit out and I'm like, oh shit, I was wrong. You know what I mean? Like they would Google it. Yeah, yeah. I'd be like, damn, Google got me. <laughs> yeah. I would never admit that I'm wrong. But then I got to a point where I'm like, listen, if I'm going to grow as a person, I have to be able to admit that I'm wrong. If I'm going to be able to take, like one of the things that's really important, and especially as a man, because let's be real, us men, we can be too proud sometimes. Right. percent yeah yeah so as a man it's especially important to be like yeah i was wrong mm-hmm. like let me learn from this situation this is how you improve as a human being and i think a lot of things help me with that martial arts you know getting humbled um and just being on my own when i was 18 like moving out okay and just learning like okay i need to be more self-aware i need to be able to see myself from a third person perspective and to be able to do that I need to admit when I'm wrong mm-hmm. because if I never admit that I'm wrong, that means I'm a perfect person, which I'm not. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to stay stagnant forever. So I got to this point where like, when I, this is why like even, I don't know if you noticed, but in this podcast, I'm unsure of something. I'll be like, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to directly quote this. Mm-hmm. This is important to me. And it's like <laughs> when I hang out with my family and then we get into like some sort of argument and they're just very clearly wrong. They'll still like, they'll try to twist it in a weird way to make, or they'll change the subject altogether to make sure they come out right. Yeah. And that's not, you know, like I've accepted the fact that my parents are very old, so they're not going to change. <laughs> and I love my mom and dad, mm-hmm. but that's just something. But that's something I talk to my sister about because I know she's young enough to accept the fact yeah. that sometimes you're going to be wrong. but you, And you need to admit that you're wrong. Hmm. That's it. That's a, I think that's an excellent, excellent point to make. Because it's hard to admit that you you be, you you're wrong. Yes. You know, and especially it's especially if it's something that you've held, you know, you've held quite strongly to, and someone yeah. says, actually, <laughs> you don't want to be that person. Actually, <laughs> you know, you don't want to be that person. But when someone says, <laughs> yeah. well, you know, like I said, like with today's culture. Maybe it's not just today. Maybe it's just because everything's public that we see the nuances of two people debating. But whenever someone senses weakness in the other person in a debate, like I said, like when Andrew Shear and Trudeau had the whole blackface thing, like he's trying to like dunk on him. You know what I mean? Instead of just being like, okay, like why did you do that? Like tell me, like, you know what I mean? Like you're not giving people sort of any leeway to explain themselves. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like, it's like, oh, and, and, and it's like that from both sides. I'm not, I'm not saying only the conservatives do that. Like, I, I think, I think, uh, let's be real. I feel like all the politicians yes, do that. All the much. politicians do that. They sense perhaps weakness. not like some of the American, like Andrew Yang. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's like they sense weakness and then they just, they just pounce and it, and it's not just politics. It's, it's, it's everything. We, we don't give people a chance to apologize. We're like, oh, it's fake. They're just, they're only apologizing because they got caught. But it's like, why are we pretending like we're perfect people? Mm-hmm. Or they or they make people f- apologize by force. Yeah. Which I don't think is any better. You know, like, no. you have to apologize. Otherwise, you lose your job. It's like, well. Yeah, yeah, no. That's that's not, that's not how you apologize. Yeah. You don't apologize. I don't say sorry to you. I don't say sorry to someone just because I think there's a consequences, consequence to not saying sorry. I say sorry because I think, man, I, I was in the wrong and I really want the other person's forgiveness. 
you don't say sorry because oh I don't want to lose my job so I'm yeah. just gonna hey yo I'm sorry guys what I said was super intense but uh, I don't mean anything yeah well well that's difficult right because it's like if you don't apo- if you apologize people are gonna be like oh see he admitted he or she admitted that she or he was wrong but then if you they're just like see they were wrong the entire time and then and, and people just try to dunk on them even though they apologize yeah not cancel them anyways <laughs> <laughs> but if you don't apologize, apologize same thing same thing oh you won't even apologize won't even, it's like there's no winning like once the public decides yeah. they're gonna get you there's just no appeasing them and like this is a huge problem in our culture man it's a huge man the, it is a huge culture and I think it's I think I think it's that forgiveness you know forgiveness is a is is, is something it's like a superpower yeah you know yeah I think it, I, I really think it's a super su- sort of superpower where sometimes you harbor ill intentions and and and, and anger towards people, but then you're really just hurt, harming yourself because yeah. you know you're you're like oh, kind of pent up. Yeah, like why are you holding on to all of that? You know, it's like a lot of times if you're really mad at someone and you just want them, you're like, oh, they they owe me an apology. Very often, they're not even thinking about you. So you're you're holding on to all this negative, all these negative feelings, yeah. and I think a lot of people who go after someone online based on something they did. Ten, it depends on how bad, right? Mm-hmm. Like if they did something horrendous ten years ago, I get it. But if they made like one insensitive joke on Twitter that has nothing to do with anything, yeah, there's no need to. <laughs> What's up, Caitlin? <laughs> uh, <laughs> see you later. Yeah, that's IJ's wife. Uh, yeah, no, it's true that, that you don't really um, yeah, like. There's there's no real point in holding on to that anger. Yes, you know, if it's so, if it's trivial, and something you can just get past. And a, and a lot of things are trivial. A lot of things, and I just feel like a lot of times it's people who don't really have anything better to do. Yeah, and it's like they almost want to see this kind of downfall. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like it's uh, it's entertaining for them. It's like this, you know, and I, I don't know. That's something in our culture that needs to change because it's, it's only getting worse. Again, you can't hold people to the standards of today, 10 the, years ago. Or even 50 years ago. I mean, I'm sure, I, I'm sure, Jen, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, they look back and think about our society. Yeah. Man, what a bunch of evil, corrupt yeah. human beings! Then, you know, I don't know what it would be. I don't. I'm yeah. trying. To, maybe it'd be like owning pets. You know, pets. Something that I've said to you. I, th- I don't know if I've said to you, but something that I I've said to someone is, PETA is super inconsistent. Okay. No, and, they are. You know, they they they're all about like saving the pig and the chicken. Yeah. But then the same PETA people will own a pet that will live in the house, and they'll go to work eight hours of the day, leave their animals by themselves this is the worst part they won't feed their carnivore cat meat <laughs> right yeah. so 50 100 years from now maybe the pita in the future maybe it won't be even be a pita but they look back they're like man the society was so evil keeping these animals by you know without just by themselves they didn't have their, their freedom yeah you know what i think it's gonna be i think it's gonna be like robot rights you think it'll be robot rights? Yeah, I feel like maybe one day someone's gonna look back on this podcast. I'll be like, look at that bigot Jeff. Won't even, <laughs> won't even let his son marry a robot. And I'm, I'll have to be like, no, I'm not talking to this robot. It's not a real person. It's like, wow, dad, you're horrible. I'm, I'm not accepting her into the family. <laughs> uh, it, it is one of those things. I think we have a tendency to judge the people in the past by the our standard of mm-hmm. morality which mm-hmm. is completely and totally utterly insane in my opinion like you you just can't do that well, well it's also like this culture of i'm better than you kind of thing mm. like oh i'm woke i'm enlightened <laughs> like I, I i know you know what they're kind of saying is i know the next step in human evolution yeah and i'm woke i'm 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 better than you yeah you know? i'm ahead of the trend yeah everything. i'm yeah and it's just like it's just this way for people to feel special by being like, oh well, like you know, like I'm, I'm so morally righteous. Are you really? It's like, do you think, like some some of these people are kids, right? Like some of these people who are being shamed online mm-hmm. for something they said ten years ago yeah. when they were thirteen. Yeah. 
you know, only 23. They're 23 now. Still kids. They're kind of kids, right? So now some of this, sometimes even worse, they look like a 14 year old. And it's about something they said when they were nine. Mm-hmm. And then people are like just shitting on them, making them feel horrible about themselves. Like that's like, you're like, you're a good person that you're making this 14 year old feel suicidal. Yeah. Cause I don't remember, I don't know what you were like when you were 14, but when I was 14, I was very insecure. Mm-hmm. Right. hundred percent. I'll show you. <laughs> me when I was 14. The picture of you. In the no, no, I just found this. Okay. <laughs> but uh, keep going. But it's like when you're 14, you, 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 it's like it, when people have a bad opinion of you or even, even now when someone has a bad opinion, of you, it doesn't feel good, Yeah. but it's like exasperated when you're 14. So imagine like the whole internet is like this 14 year old is a piece of shit. Like you, you would like, you'd want to kill yourself. Yeah. This is me when I was 14. Let me see that. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And this is me when I was you look pretty tall. I thought you, uh, I would, Okay, no, tiny. you look tiny there. Yeah, not this. And this is me with my roommate's topless. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, you look like an Asian fuckboy. Bro, I look like I could be on a poster of Feed India. Feed India. <laughs> what are you guys wearing? Like the hats? The hats? Yeah, we we're trying to be cool. We we're trying to, like, we're all tensing. You should, you should make that the picture of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, it. You, I I just don't understand why some sometimes we, not I don't I I think I I, I understand why people like to make pronounced judgment on like the past because it it makes you feel superior yeah. like you are better than them like they should have known better but really if you were in their situation would you have known better no I didn't know better back then. I didn't like, like I said, there's, there's, you know, that the Facebook, I hate that Facebook memory thing. Oh, that pops up. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. 10 years ago. I'm like, man, what other cringy shit did I write back then? I'm thinking of deleting my account and just starting over again. Yeah. I was thinking like, yo, what if like, you know, I get some sort of following. I mean, I don't really have like a YouTube channel or anything, but what if I get some sort of following and then people decide we're just going to, we're going to take this dude down Yeah, and fuck this guy. It's true. And they just take some shit up from my past. But I think that's what makes people afraid. But it's like, you shouldn't really be afraid. You know, everyone has a past. Everyone's you, made mistakes. You, you shouldn't be, but you should be in yeah, the sense no. that people are like, just because it's not like, I don't think it's, you know, morally correct to dig up stuff from people's past when they're, you know, they don't even know who they are. Mm-hmm. They're 12 years old. They don't yeah. know anything. But even if you're older though, like for example, I think Joe Rogan was in the, was in the news last week, maybe or the week before, and they were trying to uh, deplatform Joe Rogan because of some jokes that Joey Diaz. <laughs> Joey Diaz is one hundred percent inappropriate. Yeah, just, he's, he's not. Anyone who listens to him knows the guy just. Yeah, that's made. just stick. That's a stick. Yeah, he's one hundred percent. And one of the jokes that he was making on Joe Rogan, ten, Jeff, ten years ago. Oh my goodness. Okay, ten years. Oh, I think maybe nine years ago. Let's be. I think it was nine years ago. Joey Diaz, and you know he says. It's Joey Diaz. So he says, yeah, there are these like young comedian, uh, young uh, up and coming Hollywood actresses who want to come on stage. But he, and then he goes on to say, well, you know, they can't come on stage unless they give me a blow job. Right? Oh, uh, and, and then it's not even that bad. And then, and then Joey Diaz goes on to say, he's like, yeah. And then, you know, they'll happily come and give me a blow job. And then Joe Rogan and whoever was, I think it's Brian Redband or something. They're both laughing. Yeah. And, then they, and then Joe Rogan goes, well, how many girls have you done this to? Or how many girls have you asked? Okay, I see where this is going. And, no, and that's then, kind of messed up. And then Joey Diaz like, we're like 20, man. <laughs> and they're all laughing, right? So that was yeah. the clip. That was from like 10 years ago. Okay. So this comes out. And it was like some random woke liberal CNN or CBN guy. Okay. Some guy brought it up. And they were trying to deep from Joe Rogan and Joey Diaz saying, look. Look at these disgusting guys and talking shit like this, and you know, talking, you know, talking about females so poorly. And mm-hmm. he's like Harvey Weinstein; he's no different than Harvey Weinstein. No. And you know, it's like, well, first of all, it is Joey Diaz, and I'm not defending Joey Diaz and whatever he did. But well, if he actually did that, that's pretty messed up. It is. It yeah. is. But so in, in that video, he goes on to say, he goes on to say, I'm, "It's what everyone does in Hollywood," which. Is correct. Yeah. From what we know with Harvey Weinstein, yeah. Jeffrey Epstein, though he's not in Hollywood, 
it seems to be what everyone does. Brad Pitt apparently used to be a used to uh, sleep around to get his. Oh, okay, <laughs> I was saying like I thought you were about to say Brad Pitt was one of those guys, and I'd be like, no, I feel like he doesn't need no, to do no, that. He was. Uh, he used to like do uh, what do you call them? Favors, I suppose. Yeah. Okay, because I thought you were saying it was the other way around. No, no. And I was thinking like Brad Pitt doesn't need to do that. That that yeah, dude's good looking as hell. But you know that once again, it's about ten years ago. Joey Diaz, I think he's like sixty eight or something. He's like mm-hmm. fifty eight. Yeah. Even still, maybe Joey Diaz has changed his mind. Maybe he hasn't. <laughs> it's just that if that's true, that's pretty gross. It is pretty gross. Yeah, it, it is. But I don't know if you should be deplatforming people. Um, and maybe it was a joke. For all we know, that's what it sounds like to me. That's why I'm more inclined to say like, just let it be. This sounds like it's just a joke, but I think that's like, like I said, right? There's always nuances to every situation, and I think a lot of these movements, at the heart of it, it's a good thing, in the sense that like women are not being taken advantage of, Mm -hmm. right? And I like that. That's that's very good yeah it's very good but I just think some people take it way too far and they start canceling people who didn't really even do anything wrong Mm -hmm. like it's just like yeah it this is this is a very hard to talk about subject because I think it's so polarizing when it really shouldn't be right Mm -hmm. it should be like we don't want people to be sexually um, uh, well it's pretty much sexual assault but like we don't want someone to be taken advantage of yeah taken advantage of that's exactly it yeah and but then it's like but at the same time some people are happy to be taken advantage of for i mean that's just yeah and 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 like that's that's it's like it's it's one of those things right it's like if you're using your position of power to get sexual favors it's pretty gross and you're a pretty bad person but at the same time it's like if someone it's like if someone is willing to do but this is the problem, right? You can't bring them in yeah. without the knowledge of that and just drop it on them. Yeah. You know what I mean? You can't bring someone in and like promise like, them and then say, oh, actually the uh, contract yeah, at the bottom yeah. says. Yeah, yeah, like this is the last part of it. Yeah. No, that's gross. If you put a Craigslist ad out. Say, say, for a blo- for a blowjob, yeah. you will get the stage. Yeah. I'm going to put you in the, in the next Harry Potter. Right. If you uh, <laughs> If you suck my dick. And people respond, hey, there's nothing wrong with that, right. whatever. But if you just put an ad out, like, oh, I'm casting for Harry Potter's mm-hmm. son in the next movie, who knows when that's going to come out. And then they show up, and you're like, oh, you almost got the part, you just got to suck my dick. Yeah. That's gross. That, yeah. And, like, right. you know what I'm saying? Like, that's why, yeah, like, that's that's my that's my opinion on it. I, I think that's, I think that's what most people would I would say most people would agree with you on that. It's the same. I mean, it's the same thing with like having a sugar daddy, right? Yeah. You go meet this older gentleman. Mm -hmm. You make a contract with them. Sometimes it's sexual. Sometimes it's not sexual, apparently, which I, I I just, I, I'm very skeptical of it not being non-sexual personally. Well, it goes back to that whole fake fulfillment thing, right? Right. They both kind of know. That it's not real. But people do a lot of mental gymnastics, to justify things, things that they do. Yeah. So, you know, like the guy probably tells himself like, well, you know, she's maybe, she's probably attracted to me because I'm successful. So it's like, that's a part of my, my personality. That's like the mental gymnastics that he does. Yeah. From her perspective, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the mental gymnastics you I have to do I love the there. way your belly flops. <laughs> well, you could be like, oh, well, I'm really attracted to him because he's a successful man. And he can provide, and yeah. to me, that's sexy. There's a lot of mental gymnastics that people do. Like, one of the things that we can talk about when it comes to mental gymnastics is people who are, you know, authority figures who are corrupt. Mm. Where they're able to justify almost every, anything. To- anything that they do. So anything from government officials in a shady, you know, in a shady country to okay so right now everyone's talking about police officers yeah. right and yeah. this is very controversial right now i personally know a few police officers not all of them i would say i would say the majority of them are good people not all of them i think are fit to be police officers mm-hmm. because like every other group of people police officers 
are very nuanced. So right now there's this investigation going on with, I believe it's the RCMP. Um, and this is this is, doesn't even have anything to do with uh, the defund the police movement. Yeah. It has nothing to do with that. This is independent of that. And it's about how they're selling um, insider information to tow truck companies. Oh, yes. Yeah. So this was in Ottawa, isn't it? I believe so. But it's, but now they're investigating more and they're saying uh, the, the network is wider than that. It's more people involved. I knew this for a very long time. Yeah. And I think a lot of people have known about this. It's kind of like an unspoken thing. Sometimes the cops sell information for money. Yeah. And it, it, it can even get to the point where, you know, oh, okay, so one of the things that people are talking about right now, not specifically Canadian police, but a police officer will make an arrest half an hour before the shift ends. Okay. And it's a BS arrest. Why do they do that? Why? It's because they get paid overtime. For making an arrest. So if they make the arrest, they have to write the paperwork. They have to, like, watch the suspect, uh-huh. right? So they have to stay for overtime. So now they're making extra money. Time and a half. So they do. They, they actually do this? This is an accusation that um, some defense lawyers have been putting out. Uh, I'm sure this happens. What percentage of police do this? I don't know. Yeah. But I think we can say for a fact that there's a lot of corruption in certain police departments. Like any group of people. Yeah, like have, any group yeah. of people. Now, the problem with this is that it's such an important job with so much power that you can't afford to have that kind of corruption, hmm. right? Because if you go to a Canadian tire, it's like, okay, if you go to Canadian tire with a toxic work culture mm-hmm. and all of them treat you like shit, they're rude to you, whatever, you're like, well, I'm just here because, you know, soap is on sale for two ninety nine. You're not there for the good customer service, so yeah. you kind of just put up with it. Okay, whatever. But with the police, if there's a toxic work environment, you're potentially taking someone's life away, mm. right? So we can't afford to have that. And the mental gymnastics that some of these officers have to do to justify their corruption, mm. and, I, I, and I have an idea of what they would say to themselves, right? Like, I'm not a police officer, but it's like, I know some cops. Mm-hmm. It's this idea that like, okay, well, okay, let's, let's talk about um, the 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 tow, the tow truck company yeah, yeah. controversy. Well, you could tell yourself, well, you know, like someone has to tow it anyways. Mm-hmm. If I give out a ticket and someone has to tow the car or if I respond to an accident and someone has to tow the car, someone has to tow it anyways. They might as well be the ex. Yeah, I might as well make 200 bucks off of it. Mm-hmm. But then this puts you in a situation where you might give out more tickets. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like there's a conflict of interest now. Yep. But you tell yourself, oh, well, you know, like someone's got to do it anyways. Like I might as well benefit. Like I'm putting my life on the line. Like why shouldn't I make some money on, off of this? And this can become a very slippery slope. When it comes to corruption, like I said, it's it's everywhere. It could be, it's not just the police, but because of how tight a police department can be, it can that kind of attitude can infect the entire department in mm. a short period of time. Mm-hmm. Within the span of a couple of years, the whole the whole department can be toxic. And it's not just, I think I gotta be careful about how I talk about this, but it's not just, um, it's not just black people that are disproportionate. Maybe, okay, I'd have to look into the statistics more, but people talk about how black people are disproportionately affected by this. Whether that's true or not, I'm not 100% sure. I'm inclined to say that it is. But it's not just black people. Because it's it's just like when you give someone a lot of power, it's it, it takes a special human being to not abuse it. Mm-hmm. I have a friend, very, very close friend of mine. His brother, I think I told you about this. His brother was uh, assaulted by, the, by a police officer. Mm-hmm. Um, he had his... And you know you could you could Google this. I'm not gonna say his name on here, but uh, he was handcuffed against a vehicle, mm-hmm. and the officer punched him in the back of the head three times mm-hmm. while he was handcuffed against the vehicle and threw him on the ground. Um, he did get a pretty severe brain injury, and he later, you know, committed suicide uh, while on drugs. And 
you know, they're just coming up with all this. The defense is coming up with all this bullshit to try and defend him. They're saying, oh, well, he was just trying to protect himself. Well, why was he trying to protect himself? The the suspect was against the car handcuffed. Right. Oh, well, he was bleeding. So, you know, the officer was worried that he might spit at him and he might have AIDS. So if he was bleeding, he's bleeding because he punched him, man. Like. And it's just like, I don't know how. And that wasn't his first time assaulting someone. Yeah. He assaulted someone else. You mean the cop, the same cop? It's the same cop. Yeah. Assault, there was another assault charge against him. So it's like, what's this guy doing on the force and why are, why are we protecting him? Right. So there was some sort of, uh, so the jury found him guilty and there was some sort of um, loophole mm-hmm. about some sort of language that the judge used. I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to repeat it. So they're just like, we want a retrial. And then COVID-19 happened. Oh, okay. And now it's just delayed in, indefinitely. So this wow. cop is still not seeing justice. It's crazy. It's insane. And it's like this culture of within, I'm not saying all police forces, within certain police forces. It's tough. Sometimes you have good people going into the police force. I was reading an article the other day. One of the guys who knelt, who who kneeled on George Floyd, Mm -hmm. he was like a black guy. Yeah. He's a black police officer. Well, he looked like he was another guy who kneeled on him. I thought it was just one guy. Well, it's just to help him detain him. Okay. So like this is the one guy who kneeled on him that killed him, but yeah. when they were detaining him, one guy kneeled on his back. Okay. And he stood by while George Floyd was, you know, suffocated. Yeah. Um he looks part black, but the media is saying he's fully black, but you know, you know how the media can be. Yeah. He actually vowed to reform the police with his he was because his family don't like police. And he said he was going to reform the the police department. The specific this is before this is before oh i see now he's arrested and charged yeah um you know as a accessory to george floyd's death wow. so it's like it's very it's very it's kind of like you go in there as this rookie bright-eyed rookie and I'm not, I'm not talking like i have personal experience but just from other people's accounts yeah what they tell me and you have this like you have dreams of like you know making a big change yes yeah and you go in and you quickly realize you got to fall in line mm-hmm. because that's the only way you're going to make it in this yep. business. Because that's what it is, a business. You know, if you don't fall in line, you get cut. You get cut. And then how are you going to provide for yourself? Yeah. Human would, beings, like, we conform by nature. Yeah. Because you, and I'm sure that's part of an evolutionary trait where the ones who didn't conform were left out, out, out of the group. And then they were the ones who ended up suffering. So, you know, there's a sort of perhaps within our own brain that says, oh, look, when the, when a situation arises, it says, hey, it's best you conform because you don't want to be left out of this group. You know, you're already in this mm-hmm. group. You don't want to be left out and cast out. But yeah, with this, with the police, you would think that the criteria for becoming a police officer would be extremely high. Yeah. Like it would it's be extremely always difficult. Case. Because I know you've told me there are some people that you know who you think would not, which should not be in, in the forces. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I just, uh, and, I'm not going to call them out yeah, specifically, yeah, but there's just certain character traits that I don't think mesh well with being yeah, a police officer sure. that I've I mean, seen these people. Yeah. Display. One of them would be just short tempered. If you're short tempered, you mm-hmm. probably shouldn't be a cop. Definitely. You know, because. You're treat you if you're coming in contact with a suspect, and if the person let's just say is a suspect, they're, they're not gonna easily say, "Hey, okay, you know, you can arrest me." Or even if they're not a suspect, it's yeah. not gonna be the case. The, the The issue is also, you know, and I, I know a lot of people have been talking about this, but it's just the fact that police officers, a lot of them, don't have proper combat training. Yes, they teach you how to shoot a gun. They teach you how to detain people, kind of. But you're not really confident in your ability to handle yourself in a physical confrontation. Yeah. So when you end up in a lot of situations like that, I think, and I'm not speaking from a place of judgment because I think a lot of people are like this, like, but your inability to stay calm during a physical confrontation can really escalate some of the things that you were, or you are willing to do. Mm -hmm. And sometimes this ends in someone getting seriously injured or dead. Mm -hmm. Right. And like, that's the problem. I think a lot of, I think more police officers should have. I don't, it seems like a joke almost when people say like, "Oh, 
police officers should learn jujitsu. I think they should. Like just just to have some. They really should. Yeah, just to have some knowledge of what can and can't kill a person. Mm-hmm. What's effective when it comes to detaining and what's you know gonna kill them. Yeah. And I don't know. I just think um, it's just like it's such a hard job. You get put into situations where you know, 90% of the population are never going to see. Um, Now you got to, I mean, people historically just didn't like the police to begin with, but now people really don't like you. It's a lot of stress. And it's like, if you're not going to be held to a higher standard, like you're just not going to be able to handle that job. It's, it's, you know, and I'm not, I'm not trying to say this from a place of judgment because like, I don't think, I considered being a police officer actually for a period in my life. Yeah. Um, I chose not to go that route, but you know, I went to a few seminars and stuff and I talked to police officers seeing the process, but looking into it further, I realized like, this is not the life for me. Mm. It would just be way too stressful. The kind of hours you work, the irregular shifts, um, just everybody hating you mm-hmm. and the amount of, you know, just stress you're in when it comes to fear for your personal safety. Yeah. Your family safety. Your family safety, exactly. Mm-hmm. And you, I think you are right about the training. I know that there's a uh, there's a precinct down in the states that has made uh, training jiu-jitsu com- compulsory for yeah. all their officers. Yeah, which is a great move forward. And I think I really do think that they should. You know, obviously, I'm I'm no I, I'm I'm obviously not a cop myself, but I really do think, you know, having trained jiu-jitsu, that there. It would be. I. I just don't understand why it was. It was never mandatory. Like it has been shown through the UFC. UFC one, UFC two, UFC three. I mean, even still now, you would think that by ne- by this point, you know, the police forces would have gotten it. Like, oh yeah, this is this is UFC fighting one of the premier fighting sport uh, fighting events. Everyone, almost everyone in the sport knows jujitsu. Yeah, and they've used it, and we've seen high level Khabib using it properly i mean properly in the sense yeah. in khabib's term properly so he's just like smashing people but yeah but it is one of those few martial arts where you can effectively detain someone without smashing their face in yeah. right can yeah, you just control them. brain damage it yeah i and there are videos i mean if people want to see it there are there are videos you can watch on youtube just like um i think it's gracie Com- gracie jiu-jitsu or gracie breakdown i think that's what's the YouTube. yeah i've seen a few of those yeah and where they show you like Cops who are trained Gracie Jiu Jitsu or cops who are trained Jiu Jitsu um, detaining suspects and cops who had not trained Jiu Jitsu and and the cops who weren't trained, you could almost immediately see. Like there was one one particular video of um, of two cops trying to detain this one guy and they had two big dudes trying to detain a like a normal sized man. Yeah. And they tase him. But the guy just like he like he's getting tased and he gets up and he somehow manages to toss the two cops over right he tosses them over and he runs to his car grabs a gun and starts shooting at the cops and then Jeez. jumps into the car and just drives off but then i think at this neither of the cops were um, severely injured but that was you know it was like if you had trained jiu-jitsu two guys who trained jiu-jitsu versus one guy who hadn't trained jiu-jitsu yeah even one guy who trained jiu-jitsu versus the guy who doesn't train jiu-jitsu but you know, the other, th- the other thing is that it calms you. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people, not just police officers, but a lot of people, especially men, walk around with this, like, chip macho. on their shoulder. Yeah, oh. this macho, like, I got to be tough. I got to prove that I'm tough. If you see a lot of these um, situations, how they escalate, it's because someone was dismissive of the police officer. Mm. So he's like, hey, I got to talk to you. It's like, oh, man, I'm not talking to you. But it, you know who you're talking to? It's like they feel like their their masculinity is being challenged, mm. you know, and then it escalates and they're like, I'm going to show this guy and they beat the shit out of the dude. Yeah. That doesn't bother me. <laughs> like when I'm, you know what I mean? I don't, that doesn't bother me when it bothers me when people get beat the shit, get, get the shit beat down. But that's, that's not, not what I'm I, trying to yeah, say. Yeah, I understand what I'm you're saying. saying. It doesn't bother me when someone's dismissive towards me. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's just like when you train jujitsu, you're humbled so much by people who are better than you. Sometimes by people who are smaller than you. Yeah. Sometimes by people who who have trained less than you. Yeah, yeah. it happens, it right? Happens. Like you have to be humble and you get used to that. You don't walk around with that macho bravado. Some people do. Yeah. 
but the vast majority of people don't walk around with that macho bravado yeah like oh, i gotta fuck someone up <laughs> you know it's not like that so that calmness it transfers it, over yes 100 percent. and you can avoid a lot of these situations to begin with like you don't escalate them yeah and it's like i think that's so important man i mean especially if you're a cop because you, like you were saying this job is already so stressful a you want to be calm yeah. you want in a state of like calmness mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people a lot of people who get a taste of power and authority mm -hmm. they let it go to their heads now i experienced this when i was six years old <laughs> okay right tell me about yeah. this right before i went i came from china i was in the first grade i never finished first grade because i moved to canada yeah and uh, i remember one time there's a guest speaker who came in who was asking questions yeah oh sorry not asking questions but like teaching sorry yeah she was asking like sort of like qu quizzes like she's giving like quizzes and stuff like that right and i gave some pretty good answers i don't know why but that day it just clicked yeah. for me and then all the teachers were like wow he's the next class representative they gave me this little armband dude i started walking around like with my hands behind my back and shit <laughs> Yeah, and then like other kids walk coming to me, and they're just Captain like Jeff. class representative, you know, like um, what are we doing today? And I just be like, oh, you know, like I'm still thinking about, like I was acting like I was the shit, like I literally walked around with my hands behind my back. I thought it was so dope, and then, you know, like when I lost it because they 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 it's like it it's like every two months or something. Okay, they change. I was just like, wow, why was, why was I acting like that? You know, and I've always remembered that, like even as an adult. So the other day. I um so right now because of COVID nineteen, fitness equip equipment is a commodity. It's very hard to get a hold of, and I'm always in the process of building my home gym and expanding it. Mm -hmm. So I've been going to Fitness Depot a lot, and they have very specific hours. They open every day at eleven, and they close every day at four. So I go over to Fitness Depot, um, and there's always a lineup because they only only let you know one person per salesman at a time oh okay yeah that's strict yeah so like unless there's a salesman yeah to walk you around the store you have to line up outside oh i see i see okay. it's more strict than most stores yeah yeah. like you have to Probably be because people are touching to see if yeah you have to be with a salesperson to go inside so you have to wait in line and the dude who's like running the door is acting like he's the shit like he's I'm like dude you like why are you acting like this man like okay he's like literally sitting I wish I could like take a picture of this guy but I didn't he's literally sitting on this like really fancy patio chair with his shades on a yeah. clipboard under an umbrella and he's like tapping it right so I walk up and he's like so I I just step into line right because I'm like okay they're gonna let me in I'm gonna buy my stuff I'm gonna go home yeah. he's like hey you come here that's how he talks to me I was like yo son like isn't this like customer service, yeah, customer service. What kind of shit is this you come here and i walk over i'm like yeah what's up man and he's like what's your name i'm like jeff and he's like what's your phone number it's like 613 whatever whatever i'm not gonna say on his podcast yeah, i was like, like whoa, whoa i was about to stop yeah. <laughs> uh and then he's like okay step back in line this is the whole interaction I don't care that much but i was thinking i was like yo man like you're just you you, you manage a fitness goods store like why are you acting like you're the shit mm. who talks like that it's because like because fitness equipment is such a commodity and he and he, he feels like he, because he has the privilege of allowing people to come in and out of the store yeah like if he thinks you shouldn't come in you're not coming in yeah he's like letting that go to his head and he's act. The, the people inside, like the salespeople, they're fine. They're great. Yeah. But just this guy outside, I'm like, dude, like, why do you think you're so important? Like, I don't understand. Like, were you like this before the pandemic? <laughs> Maybe the pandemic rebirthed something inside of him. But that's what I mean, right? When you give certain people that kind of authority, you know, six-year-old me or this guy. <laughs> like, It's a recipe for this a sort of, this, it's a recipe for power tripping. That's oh, what it definitely. Is. Right. And that's why when you see a lot of these situations is people being like, Hey, I need to talk to you. And they're like, I'm not talking to you, man. They're like, Excuse me, do you know who you're talking to? And it's like 'cause 'cause they're like, I have a badge, I have a gun, you know, like you need to you need you need to respect, respect me. me. It's 
yeah man it's 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 a strange world we live in and man i think i think the 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 one thing that i i i hope happens within you know our neighbors down there and then uh, you know for us is that more precincts i don't know if we call them precincts here i'm presuming they're like departments departments okay that they would actually do do jujitsu i had a a friend of mine i contacted him and i was like yo um because he's 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 in the forces uh he's in the he's in the yeah he's in the forces and i was like yo listen man you know there's a lot of stuff going on around cops and people's sentiments around cops and a lot of mistakes have been made of course and I think you have an obligation to train jiu-jitsu. I've been training jiu-jitsu, and I really do think you should train jiu-jitsu as a police officer. You should train it. Mm-hmm. You have an obligation for your own, for your safety, and for your, you know, the sus, the people you come in contact with. Yeah. And you know, we were talking back and forth, and he's like, "Okay, man, I'm going to look into it." And obviously, with COVID, just like nothing's yeah, like open right now. Train. And it's the worst time, but buy yeah. the book Gracie breakdown DVD, <laughs> you know, but I was like, man, I wish I could tell other cops like, Hey, like I wish I had other cop friends that I could tell like, Hey guy, you should train jujitsu. If you don't already train jujitsu, mm-hmm. like judo is great. Like I, I've, I've heard that all the cops have to train judo in some, but judo is like, if you're tossing someone Japan. on concrete, Oh, you'll kill them. You kill them. Like you're, you're essentially like smashing their head into the earth. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, but yeah, I, that that that's that's something that I you know, if anything about the this whole defund the police, I hope it's more like. What 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 what's that term? Um, reorient the funding towards getting cops into programs, jiu-jitsu programs. Yeah, I you know I agree with that sentiment, but I also think there's certain departments that are so corrupt that you just got to start over. Mm. Specifically in the states, I can't think of. Well, actually, I can think of a few departments here, but I'm not going to name them because I don't want to get in trouble. You tell me, uh, uh, tell me when so you finish recording. Yeah, but um, yeah, man, it's uh, it's tough out there. It's tough, man. This has been a fantastic conversation. I think we we're almost three hours. Holy crap! <laughs> yeah. So, uh, for anybody else, um, you don't have Twitter, from what I remember. No. You have an it's Instagram account. Oh. Do, is it private or public? I think it's public. Okay, what's the uh, account? It's uh, J I A N dot J E F F R E Y. So that's uh, John dot Jeffrey. And is that the only social media? And uh, of course, Facebook, but Facebook's private. Much. Yeah, Facebook's private. <laughs> yeah, well, John, thank you so much for this conversation. Thanks for having me, man. I had a lot of fun. This is awesome. All right, have a good one. <laughs>